Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to our council meeting for the 15th of March 2023. Uh, we have um, opened the meeting formally with a karakia, uh, but just for the public, um, we will go back to um, our apologies um, and just noting that we have received an apology from Councillor Brannigan and that we have Councillor Boyle on Zoom. Uh, just checking that you can hear us, uh, Councillor Boyle. Yep, loud and clear. Thank you. Um, just reminding you also that if you wish to uh, vote on any matter, that we will need to see you. Uh, at present, we can't. Um, so just reminding you of that. Thank you. Um, so moving um, that apology, um, seconded by Councillor Jennings, all those in favour, against carried. Um, today is a, um, a notable day in New Zealand's history and I just wanted to um, sort of uh, acknowledge uh, the date because today is four years since the terrible Christchurch uh, event, the mosque shootings, uh, claiming the lives of 51 people, injuring 40 people across two mosque sites, changed the face of this country in fact. Uh, in more ways than one, uh, shock the nation and indeed the world. So I just wanted to uh, take a moment, a few seconds, just to reflect on uh, what has happened since that date and the four years that have ensured um, and how it's uh, impacted uh, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. That's appreciated. Okay, I know that we're into public participation. We only have one member of the public wish to speak. Mr. Russell, please come and join us. Welcome, Brett. Can you just uh, tell the table which item you're referring to in the agenda? Uh, it's the uh, report um, that the Chief Executive did, and in particular, Stormwater. <laughs> okay, you don't have a page reference or anything that we can... Um, oh, I do, but um, it's... Uh, actually, it's two documents. The submission to government, because Stormwater's mentioned there, and also... Um, page 191, thereabouts, in the agenda papers um, of the uh, Chief Executive's report on Stormwater. Stormwater, yes, it is page 190. Thank you. I appreciate right. Thanks. All yours. Kiara, Kiora Tato, and good afternoon, Your Worship, Councillors, Chief Executive, and HDC staff. It's a privilege for me to be here in my capacity as the newly elected chairperson of the Manawatu Estuary Management Team. This team includes engaged and concerned community groups, community members and HAPU members. We meet regularly with representatives from the statutory managers for the estuary and internationally recognised Ramsar site, Department of Conservation, Horizons Regional Council and of course Horofanoa District Council. We acknowledge the role all three organisations play the work you put in and the commitment you show to this outstanding natural area. The coastal reserves part of the Manawatu estuary are important environments and home to over 20 threatened species of birds, one of the most diverse ranges of birds to be found in any one place as well as fish and plants. The vision held by many in our community is to see this environment in a state where the biodiversity it supports is thriving. In many cases, the environment, birds, fish, insects, fauna and flora are under extreme pressure and are disappearing. Harpu continue to have an overarching and inseparable relationship with the Awa o Manawatu. The Mana o Tiwai hierarchy of obligation gives the first priority as the health and well-being of water. We support the need to strengthen our plans and policies to give effect to the hierarchy of obligations and ensure the Harpu relationship with the Awa o Manawatu is front and centre. To that end, we have a workshop initiative presently underway to update existing estuary-related plans. 
the current Manawatu Estuary Management Plan 2015 to 2025, prepared by the Department of Conservation, is the operative plan which will come to an end in 2025. In the circumstances, work has now commenced to begin the preparation of a new management plan which is able to take effect by 2025 or earlier. Alongside and overlapping that is the Foxton Beach Coastal Reserves Management Plan prepared by the Horifano District Council and approved in 2009. This plan is also due for review and so work has also commenced on that in conjunction with work on the other plan I just referred to. Mention was also made at our meeting last Friday on the impact of stormwater in the estuary, what Council has been doing in respect of that. And with this in mind, I note that the topic of stormwater features in two parts of your agenda for this meeting. It is referred to in the mirror report on page 7 of 28 February 2023 and your submission to central government, specifically members of the Finance and Expenditure Select Committee, regarding the Water Services Legislation Bill and the Water Services Economic Efficiency and Consumer Bill. If I may offer my personal opinion on this submission, is very well crafted and as a member of the Horofano community is an outstanding example of what should and must be done in terms of timely and pivotal representation to government on key water-related vital environmental important issues. So well done. And I hope your request to appear before the committee in support of your submission is duly granted. The second time the topic of stormwater is mentioned in your agenda papers is on the pages I referred to earlier, 1991, as part of the CO's organisation performance report for March 2023. Here the stormwater status as a general update and various street locations are covered off, but there's no mention of stormwater at Foxton or Foxton Beach. When the topic of stormwater was raised at our most recent Manawatu History Management Team meeting, I recall the 12 June 2020 resource consent application and associated environmental fix document lodged by Good Earth Matters GEM with Horizons Regional Council entitled Foxton Beach Global Stormwater Discharge Consent. The total area of the Foxton Stormwater Beach, sorry, Foxton Beach Stormwater Catchment is about 3,390 hectares, of which approximately 10% is the urban area of the Foxton Beach Township and the remaining 90% is predominantly rural. The global consent sought by GEM included discharges direct to the estuary as well as into the White Bay Creek, Holborn Parade Creek and to land via an attenuation pond system in the Sioux, Beachfields and Forbes Road subdivisions that some of us visited as part of the infrastructure visit that took place recently. The Manawatu River estuary is a principal receiving environment for the majority of Fox and Beach stormwater, and Jim has been seeking a single consent for all discharge within the catchment area. In the circumstances, we look forward to advice as to Council's intentions for this consent related process, including when Horizons may be permitted to process the resource consent process if it hasn't been superseded in the meantime. Naomi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Brett. Um, just for your information, um, I appeared before the uh, hearings committee of uh, Parliament on Monday, uh, where we spoke to our submission, uh, where we highlighted most of the recommendations that were in that submission. So, yeah, um, like a lot of councils who spend a lot of time and effort making these submissions, hopefully it will get listened to. Thank you so much. Any questions for uh, Brett? Jonathan, um, Mr. Councillor Proctor, sorry. <laughs> uh, thanks for your comments, and I totally agree that, uh, you know, we talk about stormwater, but we only usually talk about it in terms of the council, in terms of moving water from one place to another, and we forget about those receiving environments and those uh, important ecological environments that receive all our stormwater, uh, such as the Foxton Estuary, one or two estuary, um, the other estuaries in our district, but also Lake Hodo Whenua, and I think we were a little bit remiss to, to forget about Lake Hofino and a lot of our stormwater discussions. Uh, Brett, thank you. Uh, look, um, and acknowledging the, the amount of uh, time and effort that you're putting into this, um, it is a key and significant part of our the district that we certainly need to focus on and ensure that we are treating with uh, due consideration. And I know there has been a lot of talk about between us and Horizons about lifting the engagement and the work that we do in that space and hopefully that will continue to be a topic 
of conversation when we have our regular meetings with them. Um, we are, you know, keen to ensure that it does maintain its status and that we actually improve it. Um, so hopefully we can work together to do that. Sorry, Councillor Timmy Hill. If you don't mind, I just wanted to thank uh, Mr Russell for bringing the matter here. I wanted to endorse to what Councillor Proctor said because stormwater um, does seem to not be a, a priority to those receiving um, areas. And I just wanted to touch on, um, I managed to attend the Wairarapa Progressive Association meeting the other night and I was hearing the same concerns. And some of the, when you raise the coastal reserves plan, um, another matter council need to be aware of is people encroaching on the coastal reserves lands. And so I'm just putting that in our radar as well, um, where people have actually taken upon themselves to utilise dune lands, coastal reserve lands, to put lawns, picnic tables, barbecues and all sorts of things. And now they're looking at seeking council authority um, to lease these properties. So I right, thank you. Your subject has opened up another one for me. Um, but I think also that what you're raising around the stormwater issues, partic particularly to those significant sites like Ramsar, like Lake Horofanoa, um, I certainly think that's on Council's radar in terms of how we can do better. So thank you very much. Could you just turn your mic off? Thanks. Um, Councillor Tukpa. Uh, thank you. Uh, just following on from some of your um, comments around uh, White Bay Creek and the Holborn Reserve, the stormwater um, through those places. I um, wondered if uh, I could request um, follow up or an update around um, the Holborn Reserve plan, like the status. O originally, um, there was a Stormwater was a key driver of doing some work in that space and then it grew into a master plan of the whole sort of park and reserve and we were taken on a tour and then it was reduced down to another option and some recreational like type things came to the fore and some of that stormwater stuff dropped out and yet that was the initial and um, I guess I'm asking perhaps the Fox and Community Board have had further information, but um, I haven't seen any for a while and would like an update, please. So noted, we'll arrange that. Yep. Thank you, Brett. Um, there are no late items, but just to make sure that uh, councillors are aware, um, please indulge me, there will be some flexibility in terms of the order of some of these agenda items. Uh, we do have audit with us today, so we will be bringing that matter forward. Uh, but also, um, we're going to be talking um, the Foxland Community Board uh, proceedings uh, first and those items that are on that um, agenda item as well. Are there any declarations of interest? Councillor Grimstone. Mm -hmm. Um, as per declaration made in that earlier in committee, I declare a conflict of interest in relation to C2 and C3 on the in committee council agenda. So noted, thank you. So we now move to item number five confirmation of the minutes of our meeting on the 1st of February. Um, I'll move that these be accepted as a true and correct record. Um, and the minutes of the in-committee meeting of council of that day be accepted as a true correct record as well. Second, Councillor Jennings, all those in favour? Against, carried, thank you. So now moving to uh, reports. Uh, 6.1, the mayoral report of, to the 28th of February 2023. Uh, 6.1, any... Just move receipt of that report and 2.2 that this matter be recognised as not significant. Uh, seconded, Councillor Proctor, thank you. Um, any. Deputy Mayor Allen. Yeah, look, speaking to the report, uh, Mr Mayor, and I refer to the three submissions made to central government by this council. And while it's fair to say that 
there is nothing new in us submitting to government on issues. What is new is that these submissions now are attached to the order paper, and I think that it is particularly worthwhile acknowledging that because those submissions around the water services bill, uh, around uh, O2NL, and thirdly around the future for, for local government, I suspect are of great public interest, and to be able to have them in the order paper uh, gives some accountability and some transparency to our views as, as a table on those three very important issues. So it's a very good initiative, and I hope that uh, members of the public with an interest in those three matters will find the reading um, something that they can enjoy and agree with. Uh, first of all, just want to acknowledge your appointment as chair of the uh, Bureau Forum. Um, awesome. And uh, my two questions are uh, your meeting with Mayor Campbell uh, of Lower Hutt City, um, I guess not just perhaps what was the, the uh, reason there, but um, is we are you planning on doing meet the mayors in the other parts of Wellington or um, was it just that one off? And then the other question is around, um, well, thanks for sharing that you did the uh, select committee for water, um, but you've also noted um, you did the RMA one uh, recently. I wondered how that went on. If you could comment, please. Um, thank you. Um, firstly, the meeting with uh, me, Campbell Barry from Lower Hutt has been, um, it was really just to catch up in terms of are there any uh, regional issues that both of us um, could uh, discuss. Um, Mayor Barry is leading, if you like, the Entity C in the Three Waters space. Um, uh, Hui's that we have, uh, he calls those, so there was a general catch-up around Three Waters, but um, he does have an association with relatives that live um, in the district, so um, he made the op had the opportunity to call in, and um, so we had a good discussion around lots of different topics. As for the uh, RMA uh, submission, um, along with um, staff member Lauren uh, Bannock, who uh, helped me out significantly in terms of that presentation, um, we you know what those pairings are like. They're short, sharp. Um, there's a lot to get through. So, um, look, again, it was more uh, emphasising the local voice um, requirement and ensuring that our community was still well connected, whatever um, the law looks like and, and when it is, um, you know, enacted. Right, can we move to this? Can we move that? Okay. All right. Um, so we're now moving to um, 6.2, but firstly, we're going to go to 9.1. John, you're welcome to join us at the table. Thank you. So um, we're going to talk proceedings of the Te Aoha Foxton Community Board from the 20th of February 2022. Uh, we're moving 2.1, 2.2, that the report be received and that we receive the minutes. Uh, Second by Deputy Mayor Allen. All those in favour? Against Kerry. So we now move to 2.3. Um, I wonder, is, and first of all, though, is there any officer report or speaking to this report? Oh, the Chief Executive will introduce them. Uh, kia ora koutou, Your Worship uh, and Councillors. Um, before um, considering the recommendations from the Te Aoha Foxton Community Board, I just wanted to offer some additional advice um, to the table. Uh, obviously, one of the actions from the Te Aoha Foxton Community Board was that we go away and seek legal advice uh, on a number of matters in relation to the freeholding account. Uh, and one of the key um, things that advice was sought on was when we describe in the current policy um, the the cap of $5 million, whether that was associated to just cash or whether that was associated to just cash and assets. Uh, it's fair to say that for some time the 
interpretation has been that it's cash and assets um, and I draw uh, councillors' attention to obviously the legal advice which I provided um, last night um, which confirms that council should interpret that as cash only. Uh, what that means is that when considering the items in front of you today uh, you need to be mindful that uh, if council was to consult um, on both the funding associated with the promenade and funding associated with the Fox and Aquatic Centre, which were recommendations from the community board, uh, that council must do that in a way which ensures that we meet our Section 80 obligations under the Local Government Act and identifying to our community that that would be in breach of a council policy. Uh, what I want to remind council of is that that is a self-imposed policy. It's not uh, that $5 million cap is not something set in legislation. Uh, it's a policy that uh, uh, council put in place in 2009 uh, with the Foxwood Beach freeholding account policy was established. And again, draw your attention to the legal advice, uh, which I think gives council reassurance that um, by breaching your policy, uh, you're, you're not necessarily doesn't mean you can't do it. It's about making sure that we've signalled to our community really well that it would be in breach of the policy and ensuring that we give our community um, an opportunity to give feedback to that. Uh, conscious that elected members um, have both the legal advice as well as some answers to some questions that were asked in advance of today's meeting. Um, but just your worship are uh, here to answer questions or provide guidance to um, the discussion that follows. Any questions from the Chief Executive around the report? Yes, sir, yes. Yeah, look, my, I've got a questions just in relation to the Promenade um, project, um, and I don't know if you want to take those questions now or whether you wanted to hold those. If you're asking questions of the Chief Executive, then Yes, that's fine. Thanks. So I guess my question is, um, and, and I'm happy to speak to this in, in, in um, discussion, is I'm looking for your advice around uh, approval of these types of projects outside of an LTP cycle, uh, especially where there is no apparent uh, concept or project proposal. Uh, no real level of detail yet about budget, contingency, um, anything like that. And so, so, so I guess, and then the second question or, or line of inquiry is around, in terms of the priority and importance of this project, is there a, is there, are you aware of any need to, for council to make this decision now, or could it potentially wait until a, uh, an LPTP proper cycle, which we're obviously just about to start coming into. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillor Jennings, the promenade development, as I understand it, is a project that the community board have been discussing for some time. Um, it is signalled in the master plan, um, the Fox and Beach master plan, uh, but you're right um, in acknowledging that the detail of that um, uh, doesn't exist, um, but Certainly, the community board have held uh, have held a view that they see value in this project. Uh, I think one of the situations we find ourselves in is obviously council will soon consider um, the long term plan amendment, and that long term plan amendment has some really important conversations with our community. And so, in developing the long term plan documentation and in acknowledging the recommendations that the community board had made, it felt like it made sense. Um, to work to a time frame that looked to capture these freeholding account conversations as part of the long-term plan amendment. Um, that was us trying to be efficient. Um, and in being efficient, uh, I, I accept that what that can look like in some cases, that it might look rushed um, or that we might not be fully ready. Uh, the thing that council must ask itself is, um, you know, do you want to consult on the money, the freeholding account potentially um, being utilised for this project. In terms of your question around the alignment with the LTPA, um, the LTP, you're right, the promenade isn't a specified project in the LTP, uh, but nor do you have advice yet on whether 
the the funding sought would cover the whole project, how that may be stacked up in terms of competing priorities that might come into the LTP. I think it's a really valid question, um, but it's also an example of how the freeholding account hasn't in the past always been tagged towards LTP projects. It's been tagged towards um, the will of council, the will of the community board and the will of community community and we've seen that in previous decisions by this table in terms of where projects have been funded that sit outside a long-term plan. Yes, it took a bit. Uh, my question is around um, yeah, the, the finance and look, I'm going from memory but um, there was a decision uh, made to use, I'm pretty sure it was Fox and Beach Freeholding account, $100,000 a year for 10 years to do works along the foreshore of the Fox and Beach. Now, has the 10 years ended? Because that was kind of partway through my term and I haven't been hit. Like, where's that at? And is that because it's fully utilised and so they need the extra now? Please, uh, it doesn't say in the report, so I'm wondering. Um, if you recall, um, there was uh, a number of parks and reserves within the Foxton Beach area that were allocated, I think it was in the region of $100,000 per year for 10 years, and that was where that million dollars. I think the Holborn um, Park... Um, if I remember correctly, basically took a major portion of that funding and that was going to form part of that bigger project uh, that was, you know, uh, costed out at over $2 million, I, if I remember rightly, and where we applied for funding and were refused um, some funding applications. So I would assume that that money has not been spent. Um, so of the $1 million, about 750 k has been spent. Um, and if you look at the, well, looking at the forecast in terms of year end, we anticipate that it's anticipated that we would get to the $1 million, uh, but our most, not our most recent community board meeting, but the one before that, um, Mr Hester, uh, our um, Parks and Property Lead, did a presentation to the community board and highlighted that based on the work that had been committed to and the work that the community board had endorsed, we anticipated that there was about $100,000 um, that hadn't been allocated to a project. And at that stage, the community board um, were wanting some further information and advice on Flagstaff Reserve uh, and how it could potentially be invested at Flagstaff Reserve. And we were going to come back to the community board with further advice on that. No further questions. Oh, Councillor Limestone. <clears throat> it, it, it may be for John. So a couple of things are, are around this that came up. Um, so first of all, Monique, thank you for the legal advice around the application of the appropriate use of the freeholding account to potentially fund these projects. Um, and I concur with Councillor Jennings around, from my perspective, I'd really have liked to have seen some concepts which leads me to my next question as to if I was a Foxton Beach resident, is this the project that they would like to see this funds invested into or are there other more urgent measures that this money could potentially be better spent that would be within the current scope of the freeholding account policy. Is that a question for the chair? Of yeah, I'd, I'd like an opinion from the chair uh, around the priority of, of this particular project over other potential projects that may have been scoped or should be within scope. I'm, I'm quite happy to talk to that. I, I think the most important thing is we've got a slight missing piece of misinformation here, the million dollars, the $100,000 a year are allocated to the 
reserves around uh, Foxton and Foxton Beach was not from the Foxton Beach Freeholding Fund, right? It was allocated from council funds, not the Foxton Beach Freeholding Fund, right? And that's very, very important. Uh, no, I think you're incorrect there, John. I think you, it is from the Foxton Beach Freeholding account. Yeah. Well, I, I was on the community board when, when, when it happened, and I have absolutely no recollection of that happening, it being um, Fox and Beach freeholding fund aspect. I'd love to see the minutes on that. Thank you. I appreciate um, so that. just confirming that is um, certainly funding from the freeholding account. It was an item consulted as part of the 2018 long-term plan um, and just com giving councillors assurance that if you look at the financials that have been reported to both the community board and to council, you'll see um, that well signalled. Certainly didn't come from rates. The, the, the other thing I would like to say is that any money that we do spend from the freeholding account, we actually do consult with the community of Foxton Beach on it, and it's very, very important. And I notice on the minutes that have been written here, the indication is that we might have consulted with them on the... We did consult the $230,000 for the, for the promenade. That was approved by the, by the community of Foxton Beach. We have not consulted with the Foxton Beach community yet on the $500,000 for the pool. Uh, just a, a follow-on question to me, because I'm mindful that we're proposing a long-term plan amendment that will require community consultation. So the Foxton Beach community have the ability to provide submissions and uh, feedback on that. Uh, my follow-on question would be, given I attended the meeting in December at, um, in relation to the Foxton Beach um, Foxton Community Board briefing around the freeholding account, and, and it's fair to say that um, the AWI that we re represented um, expressed a strong desire for um, you know, consultation and working together. Um, between that meeting and now, what has consultation looked like? And I guess through the submission process, what will that look like in order to ensure that um, EWI's voice on these particular matters that are heard and considered by this table should we be asked to adopt? Um, th thank you for that question. It's a very important question to which we also would like an answer because uh, that was left that the officers were going to make some arrangement with EWI for our consultation because we want to find out how EWI feel that they need to be consulted and that's a very important factor and we did not want to move forward with anything until such time as we've had consultation with Amy. Um, thanks, John. Look, and also, you'll note on the agenda, 2.4 and 2.5 are about adopting these items for consultation in the long-term plan amendment. So they are still to be consulted with the community, both items. Uh, yeah, I, I appreciate that, um, Your Worship. It's just the fact that under, previously that we were done, did not put anything up to council until we had consulted with the community, and we put the horse before the cart, the cart before the horse in this particular case. I think the community should be consulted with before it's proposed, rather than after. Chief Executive's got a response. Um, through you, Your Worship, if I could just provide advice to the table that the Te Awaho Fox and Community Board don't actually have delegations to choose to consult. Um, they, the Community Board have can only make recommendations to council, and so it's because the Te Awaho Fox and Community Board only have the ability to recommend to council that we would need to bring a decision to council in order to consult. So I appreciate the sentiment, but from a process point of view, um, it always has and always would need to come to council. Thank you. Um, so moving to uh, item 2.3, the council note the board's action to engage further with Mana Whenua prior to consulting with the community on changes to the Fox and Beach freeholding account policy and strategy review 
This engagement may result in changes to the pro proposed review of the policy and strategy, which will be reported back to Council prior to further consultation. Moved by Deputy Mayor Allen. Is there a seconder? Councillor Olson. Any debate or discussion on that matter? Well, no, Deputy just, Mayor Allen, yeah. just briefly. It, it was a very clear, in fact, I, to the best of my knowledge, the unanimous view of the board that this was something that should have happened a long time ago. We've caught up with it now. It's in the Act, Local Government Act, and we need to move on and, and consult on the policy. Thank you. Um, just before I put that recommendation, just noting the departure of Councillor Proctor for a short time. He said to leave the table for uh, some other matter, uh, but shouldn't be too long. Um, so I'll put that motion. All those in favour? Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you. Item 2.4, that Council approve a proposal for $230,000 for the promenade development to be funded from the Foxton Beach freeholding account be consulted on within the LTPA for the promenade development. Do I have a mover? Not to move, no. Not to move. Just to speak to, could I just speak to the following two recommendations, Ms. May? It's about what we do and when we do it, and it's about the legal advice we've, we've received. And I think we need to discuss which of the two options we go with. Option one being uh, basically to, to pause, to complete the review first, um, the review and tidy up the policy first, and then subsequent to getting that policy right, to consult on these two issues. The second option being just to, to press on, to continue on letting the community know that what we are doing in that case is we are breaching our own policy. And um, so I, I won't get into the debate at this stage, but I wonder if that's the first step is to have that discussion because that then will lead to whether or not we want to move to 2.4 and 2.5. Does that make sense? Um, it makes sense, but I wondered whether you actually wanted to um, make a recommendation or a motion in that, in that direction. Yeah. Well, I, I could. I'm, I'm happy to move what I'm calling option one, uh, Mr. Mayor, which is which is that we uh, put on pause um, these two matters until we do a proper review of the policy, uh, because I think in saying that, um, if we were to push on acknowledging that we are, our advice is that we would be in breach of our self-imposed policy around the five million, five million um, minimum, that, that that would be... So, can I just ask that we maybe just simplify matters by getting a motion that says we pause, yes. and then we'll have the discussion and debate as to the reasons why. So the chief executive was just writing something up. Um, in the meantime, Councillor Jennings. Yeah. So, so, sorry. Just relevant to this discussion for me is a question along the lines of: Is it is it the total of both of these projects that are on the agenda paper that takes us over the five million, uh, take us under the five million limit? So, what is the what is the financial position if one if either of the projects on their own proceeded? So, for example, Fox and Paul, but not Promenade, or Promenade, but not Fox and Paul. So, can I just get some advice around that? Uh, through you, Your Worship. Uh, uh, based on our end of year forecast and based on the committed funds that Councillor Tokopoa. Um, has already asked questions on around the $1 million. Um, Council are already at the end of June. They will be under the $5 million. They'll be sitting at $4.7 million. So just to clarify, that's based on decisions that have already been made, irrespective of these decisions. Correct. Today. So so whether it be, um, whether you consult on both or consult on one, either any of them will put us in breach of the policy because we're actually already in breach of the policy based on how we've interpreted 
the policy based on the most recent legal advice, which is different to how the policy has been implemented um, since its establishment in 2009. You will note um, that there have been periods of time since 2009 where the, the fund has been under $5 million. At one point it sat at $3.2 million. So the recommendation reads that Council complete the review of the Foxton Beach freeholding account ahead of formal consultation on funding allocation to the Promenade Project and the Foxton Aquatic Centre Project. Does that meet your requirements? So moved by Deputy Mayor Allen. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Barker, thank you. Um, so any discussion or debate? Uh, not debate, but food for thought. <laughs> um, there's no mention of, of our Māori community in that motion. And so one of the one of the pieces of work that have to be done by the community board is to engage our, our Māori community. So I wonder whether that can be included in the motion. So through you, Worship, um, in drafting that recommendation, um, I've followed on the basis that you've just unanimously adopted 2.3, okay, which down. talks about engagement with mana whenua to review the freeholding account. Okay, no, thank you. Councillor Jennings. So my issue with the resolution as it is put is that in August last year, there was a whole range of discussion and debate around the Foxton pool. And there were some pretty clear signals at that point that there would be an action uh, that would be followed through where there would be consultation with the community about allocation of half a million dollars to a uh, from the freeholding account to a project that was already massively over budget and councillors at the time were wrestling with the uh, the challenge of of how to manage and how to potentially uh, you know, support that project in the face of what were massive uh, escalations in cost. And so my concern with this resolution is that that kicks the can around that discussion even further down the road. The project is underway, and so I am concerned that there will be absolutely no incentive for that community once, if the decision is to go and consult around that, that funding, to see any purpose in, in supporting an allocation because the project will be done, funded, uh, you know, the, the, we're, we're already well past, uh, I guess, the, the critical point of decision. So I would be really disappointed if uh, that conversation is not had with the community sooner rather than later because I think it's important. We committed to doing it. Uh, and um, I actually think that we can tweak the wording of 2.4 and 2.5 uh, in a way that actually clarifies that these amounts are not, we're not committing to spend the money. What we're doing is engaging community support to allocate up to an amount uh, potentially to be expended at a later time uh, and, and um, certainly in, the late, in relation to the pool, uh, that probably is sooner rather than later. But in terms of the promenade project, I feel that there is still a layer of decision making that needs to occur around this table in the context of a long-term plan where we get to assess all of the projects that are on the table, uh, all of the ideas that are put on the table, and we can assess priority uh, and also what our to total capital works program looks like where we can consider risks around supplier availability. Uh, we can think of things about cost escalation. And I note that the promenade um, proposal as it stands I think the cost estimate was based on an estimate from August last year. So, you know, potentially there's already been cost escalation. Uh, so I just don't have a level of confidence that that um, around that particular project as it is. But so for that reason, I can't support the motion as it is, and, I, and I'd rather have a stab at rewording 2.5 and 2.5. Um, can I just ask the through the chief executive, 
can we consult on amounts in those recommendations, knowing that we are in breach of the of the uh, free holding account? Uh, through your worship, yes, you can. Um, it's a self-imposed um, limit that was put in place by this council. Um, the only thing that we would be required to do is amend some of the wording within our long-term plan amendment consultation document to ensure that we're meeting. I'm very pleased that the OAG are here for me to hear me say this, to meet our, lo our legal responsibilities and advise the community that we would be in breach of our own policy under Section 80 of the Local Government Act. So you can do it, but it's about signalling to the community, do you want us to do it and are you okay if we breach the policy and knowing that we're doing it? Thank you. Okay, so we've still got the substantive motions on the table of the the, the uh, we complete the renew review first deputy mayor Arnold, did you list to speak yeah, to I, I speak to the motion i absolutely get councillor jennings point i understand that um and i am genuine in the hands of the table you know i don't i don't come to this with passion that is, is, is threatening to turn into cardiac arrest by any means. It's just about the fact that we do have a policy. Uh, the policy is the contract with the beach community. We now have new information which says that if we proceed and do the recommendations, if we do implement them as opposed to consult on them, we will be in a breach of, we call it our policy, council's policy, but in fact it is a policy which was very much developed in partnership with the Foxton Beach people. So my concern in, in arguing for the press pause was, was to keep the faith with the community and say, although we're legally able to breach the policy, it seems to me bad faith that we would do so now that we understand that that the policy is about cash reserves only. It's not about cash uh, plus, plus other assets. So that's the logic behind it, Mr Mayor, and that's the reason I moved the motion. Any further discussion? Councillor Grimstone. I guess my concern or my risk dovetails on the back of Sam's comment is that We've got a project that is is getting to a stage where we're well advanced. Um, I'm assuming that that project is dependent upon potentially having $500,000 in order to pay for it. There would be a consequence to Council's finances should we not use the freehold account um, in order to do so. And... If we also refer the matter back to the original legal advice around the freeholding account, which was in 1991, where there was opinion that was was obtained in relation to use of the fund to pay a loan that was used for sewage, the opinion was that it wasn't appropriate to use a freeholder fund to repay a loan. And I'd potentially argue that if we delay until the project is finished, that we're then entering into a position where we potentially could not then retrospectively use $500,000 to the fund. It also then asks the question around, do both of these priorities match what this community really needs right now um, as their top priority, which is the purpose of consultation as well. So. Um, I think that the legal advice that we did obtain um, and read through last night did strongly indicate to us that we could continue to do both the policy review in line with the consultation on the long-term plan amendment. Um, and given the concerns over the $500,000 in particular and the potential consequence that it would have, I think that continuing um, as is with the policy consultation happening side by side as well would probably be more appropriate for this council to move forward with. Thank you. Councillor Tukupu. Yeah, I'll just echo that um, 
the Foxton Paul redevelopment is well underway. We all went there last week and took a tour on site with the uh, construction crew and obviously there's a bill to pay and we made that decision last year with the understanding that 500000 would come from this account um, and I don't want to be stuck, you know, or, you know, council stuck in a rut um, as a result of kind of delaying this. Um, so based on the resolution, I mean, I would prefer to, if we're trying to find a happy medium, um, proceed with the fox and pull and, and wait on the, the promenade. Otherwise, you, uh, Mayor Bernie, you come up with a... Because <laughs> I, I, I can't accept not um, putting that through today. Okay, thank you. Um, look, I think unless there is anyone that wants to voice a opposite opinion to what we have received, I'm going to put that motion. Uh, that Council complete the review of the Fox and Beach Free Holding Account ahead of a formal consultation on funding allocations to the Promenade Project and the Foxton Aquatic Centre Project. All those in favour? Can I show hands? Thank you. Against? Councillor Tommy Honey, you are abstaining. Okay. Councillor Boyle is against. Thank you. So the motion is lost. Um, so now then we go back to uh, 2.4 and 2.5. And if we take those together rather than separately at this stage, do you have um, some wording, Councillor Jennings, that you would like to suggest? Um, and I mean, for my mind, um, the fact that we are saying that we're going out for consultation on these items is um, sufficient enough to indicate that we, um, we, what we want to do. I don't know whether we actually want to confuse um, the issue um, because what we are seeking for is community feedback on whether they support it or not. Yes, so, so Mr Mayor, I think what I'd be looking to do is, is sort of just tweak 2.4. I think, I think keeping them separate is probably wise at this point, but uh, framing it along the lines of the council approve a proposal to allocate up to $230,000 for the promenade or for a promenade development to be funded from the. And then, and then in terms of the obligation around the uh, advice in consultation where we have to flag that it would be in breach of our policy. That's, I don't think we have to capture that as part of the resolution. I think that that's something that's going to have to happen anyway. I think the Chief of Back Executive is about to disagree with me. Yes. <laughs> she has already written a, a note um, that will be added um, to those recommendations which says that noting that Council will notify the community under Section 80 of the Local Government Act that it is breaching the current Foxton Beach freeholding account policy. So the only response I have to that is, does cons consulting on these things breach the policy or it's actually no. allocation of the funds? And so what we are saying is that if there is support to allocate the funds, only then if the funds are actually allocated and um, dispersed, are we then in breach of the policy? So I think for the purposes of the consultation, what we're saying is we can see whether there is actually support to allocate these funds in the knowledge that if that decision were to be confirmed, then that would be in breach of the policy. I don't think there is a breach of the policy in actually asking the question. No, and we have established that. So um, as I said, we're only seeking consultation on the audits. Obviously, there will be further debate and discussion as to actually whether we confirm or otherwise um, the allocation of funding for those projects, knowing then uh, where we sit in regards to the policy. Chief Executive. Yeah, so um, through you, Your Worship, Council Jennings, you're right. In consulting, you're not breaching the policy. But what Section 80 requires us to do is signal to the community that if you were to make the decision, it would be inconsistent with the policy. And so 
what we would be doing as officers if you were to pass one or two of these resolutions is we would amend the long-term plan consultation document to ensure that we identify the inconsistency and also acknowledge anything we might do to amend the policy in the future. And I think that's where we can signal to the broader community the impending Fox and Beach Freeholding Account Policy Review, which is not to say that council is going to change the cap but it's signalling to the community the intention to do that work. So on that basis, have you got some proposed wording that retains the sentiment of 2.4 and 2.5, but essentially uh, acknowledges that we are looking for a signal around the potential allocation of these funds, acknowledging that obviously there's some advice that needs to be provided, and that if that was to be confirmed, it would potentially put us in breach of the policy? Because things might have changed around the financial position of the freeholding account as well. It's not an absolute, right? Yeah, so so I could add some text to that resolution I drafted for Mayor Burney that reads, um, noting that if council was to make the decision, um, it would be inconsistent with current policy. And therefore, its consultation needs to meet its Section 80 requirements. Councillor Tukapot. Um, Mayor Burney, um, through you, I just have a question, um, and it's it will determine, I guess the answer will help me to determine whether I support that or not. And it's along the lines, if this was goes through and it ends up, it stays within the consultation document, um, my problem goes back to the fact that there are no concepts. So when we ask the community to feedback, because there's not even a picture in there, there's no linking, supporting documentation. I mean, the, the Fox, the redevelopment's obvious. It's in their face. They can see and they go past and look, yeah, get excited about this new uh, pool. But that, they what a couple of words on a page and I'll, I'll agree to 230,000 like uh, if that's not going to be part of the supporting information something to look at or information well, I can't support that um, yeah I'll, I'll ask the chief executive to give some advice around that So the report that we provided to Council um, ahead of today and questions that Councillor Grimstone asked is essentially the extent of the information. There are some images, um, uh, but um, that, yeah, like what councillors have is what exists. As opposed to the Fox and Aquatic Centre where we have a business case, um, previous resolutions of Council and, a, and you know, a, a current project. Can maybe Mr Harvey might be able to enlighten us. The 500000 that is proposed for the Foxland Aquatic Project is for what specifically? Uh, the 500k was just part of the contract. Yeah, it wasn't for anything that was specifically detailed. Council Gribson. So the risk, the risk for me in terms of going out to consultation and look, I'm a live-in resident, so potentially from a Foxton-based resident, I'd really, really like a steer, given that we've got this promenade development where we have no image of what it's going to look like, and it's $230,000, is this really hand on heart a project that you are comfortable fronting and going to the community to ask about? Because there is a risk from the pool perspective that you have a Foxton Beach community that will argue how they are benefiting from this. And in addition to a project of 230000 with with little detail to justify it. So, you know, if, if I got a steer from Foxton Beach 
residents or Foxton residents that you feel that this is where the money should be consulted on, then I'd be more comfortable. John, have you got any comment there? Consulted on what was what's going to happen with that promenade because at the moment it's a mess. Uh, they they put wood wood there that didn't work. They've actually it's actually uh, the sand blows over the the car park all the time. It's it's they call it the promenade, but it's in fact the seaward side of, of the of the big car park, right? And the sand keeps coming over there. And the the concept was there and it was given to the Fox of Beach. Uh, Community that it would be a concrete type retaining wall in a in a in an inverted horseshoe horseshoe going out towards the sea, which actually would control the sand on, on a lot better basis. And they said, "Yes, anything is better than what we've got right now. Let's go for it." Um, Kia ora, you've been sitting pretty quietly, just listening. Um, so I'm a resident in Foxton. Um, I find it quite intriguing sitting here talking about these two matters, being a person that lives in Foxton and having no oversight of either of them um, as a resident. And the only reason I'm privy to the information is because I sit in a council and I've attended community board meetings. Um, I, I'm intrigued that you can bring a proposal as such to the table in such a way because I've heard our iwi and our hapu for a long time now saying, they would like to have Papa Kainga re-established at Foxton Beach. They would like to have a place that they can go and reconnect to. Um, these are the people that lost the land. This is why you have the fund. And yet here we are talking about everything else, about the affected people. Um, and then I'm going to talk, you know, so, so really what I'm saying is if, if I can go back to Foxton today and tell, tell the hapu over there, hey, just send council a letter and tell them you've got a $300,000 project to establish a proper kinder in Holborn Reserve, they'll pass it. Is that, is that what we're saying? You know, what's a policy? I don't actually care what the legal opinion is, and, and that it gives you an escape route. Well, as here, we, we've watched this everywhere we go. If I have a visa card, and my maximum credit on my visa card is $1,500. Guess what? When I go and put that card in the machine and I want over that amount, I'm not allowed it. I'm simply not allowed it. But we're sitting here talking about breaching our own policy, breaching the trust of our community, making decisions without any consultation, talking about a promenade that I haven't had any conversations around. Yet I've been involved in the works there. I've seen the seawall. I've seen the ineffectiveness of a seawall. And what I can tell you is you can put as much concrete out there as you like. Nature's going to take over because that's what she does. Um, the Foxton Pool thing just blows me away. I know for a fact attending Foxton community meetings and other things out there they never felt consulted around the pool, nor would they have supported the use of the Foxton Beach money being used in the Foxton pool. As far as they're concerned, the biggest pool they've got is right out their front door. So I'll probably object to both of these motions, but go for your life. But uh, I'm going to say again, you're sitting here talking about people <laughs> that lost their land, lost their homes, are still affected today, are still asking you for help to put them back on their landscape. And here we are talking about other stuff. Kia ora. So I, re you, I refer to 2.4 around the promenade development and um, just building on the response uh, given by Mr. Gerling. And I accept the challenges by uh, councillors um, Grimstone and Tukapua around what is the level of detail that has been presented to the public on the promenade. The first thing I'd note is that this has been on the radar now for at least three years. It's been a, it's been a matter that has been subject to a number of, of reports, a number of debates at board level. So it has profile as an issue. Um, in terms of public speaking rights of the board, I have 
do not recall anyone presenting to speak in opposition to the concept. So I believe on that basis there is community support for the idea. The challenge remains, and it's a fair challenge, is what exactly are the community agreeing to? And are we doing a good job as a council table when we just say, do you want a seawall? Now, uh, so do, do you want a promenade? Mr Girling is correct in saying that there were some options brought. They were they were pretty much at the concept level, I believe, and it was about wooden structures versus concrete structures. But it was conceptual, I think, and I just, just look uh, for advice as to whether that, that's an accurate statement. But it certainly was not a detailed design presented to the public. So in, ma in, in making a decision whether or not we support 2.4, and I signal that I will be supporting it, um, that we, what we need to bear in mind is, is the question first and foremost, whether there is a will to proceed by the community, and I have no evidence to believe otherwise, but secondly, whether we are doing the business correctly by not having given some very specific information to the community about what they get for that $230,000. Those are the matters for me I think we have to weigh on. Um, just to remind the table, today we are not making any decisions whether we support the promenade project or we support the, the Foxton Pool project. All we're doing today is saying that these items will go to the public for consultation, acknowledging that it is in breach of our um, freehold policy at, the, at present. But that is all we're signalling. We've already signalled that the, um, the council, the board's action to engage further on a fino prior to consulting with the community. So we've established that we're going to review the policy. But here we're not making any concrete decision about whether we actually support that project or not. We want to hear from the community. Um, and so I, I agree that that's why the past recommendation from... Deputy Mayor Allen didn't get passed because people want to see and hear that feedback. And that's, I believe, that we need to actually progress um, these items as quickly as possible so that we understand what the community actually um, want us to do. So um, I am going to uh, read, and we will do them separately as Councillor Jennings uh, recommended. So 2.4, the Council approve a proposal for 230000 for the promenade development to be funded from the Foxton Beach freeholding account, be consulted on within the LTPA for the promenade development, noting the decision may be inconsistent with the current Foxton Beach freeholding account policy. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Allen. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Olson. So, any debate or discussion on that? Yeah, I think, can I just make some comments about um, having reflected on the discussion? Um, I was, I, I flagged that I believe that this should be considered as part of an LTP process, but then I sort of moved my position thinking, well, maybe there is a, there is scope for some consultation to get a signal before we do that. But hearing the comments uh, from my colleagues around the table, I actually think it would be irresponsible for us to, to, to seek that consultation now on this project because I don't think it's well-defined enough. I don't actually think we do have a real clear scope, unlike the pool, where there's obviously a clear scope of works. I don't think we have a, a clear enough um, scope of works around the promenade project um, and uh, I don't think we have the confidence around the, the pricing. So for that reason, I won't support it. Any further discussion? I, 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 would, I would like to comment that there were drawings done about the promenade and they were shown, but it's so long ago now they've probably been lost uh, from that point of view. And, and I also am a little bit concerned that we're talking about these aspects when we haven't discussed 2.3. Sorry, is... John, I can't let you actually comment on that at this stage. But I do also want to remind the table that these are proposals recommended from the Foxton Community Board. They are our delegated authority within Foxton to actually make proposals. While they don't have decision-making abilities, they do make recommendations to this table. So I, I'm not 
saying yay or nay or whatever, but I'm just reminding the table of that. Um, any further? Okay, so the motion is put. All those in favour? Could I have a show of hands, please? Councillor Boyle. Thank you. So one, two, three, four, five, four. Against? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And can, thank you, Councillor Proctor is abstaining because of his lack of involvement in that. So the motion is lost. All right. So we now move to 2.5. The council approve a proposal for 500000 for the Foxton Aquatic Development to be funded from the Foxton Beach Freeholding Account. That will be consulted on within the LTPA for the Foxton Aquatic Development, noting the decision may be inconsistent with the current Foxton Beach Freeholding Account policy. Moved by Deputy Mayor Allen, seconded by Councillor Jennings. Any further discussion? Put the motion. All those in favour? All right, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, against. One, two, Councillor Boyle, sorry I didn't catch that. I was four. four. Thank you. And Councillor Proctor is abstaining. So the motion is passed. Thank you. Thank you, John. Um, we now move to your report, Chairperson's Report, which is on page 33. And um, thank you, firstly, um, and acknowledging the fact that you've provided the agenda with the report. It's good to see something in writing uh, for our agenda. So anything that you would like to highlight? Uh, thank you, uh, Your Worship. Um, yeah, Your Worship, I would like to update very briefly, if I may. Um, the Foxton Beach Community Centre Liaison Officer has been appointed. The Foxton Rugby Club and the 21st Supply Company are very keen on playing rugby, but uh, unfortunately Gabriel got in the way, uh, and they're looking forward to do something at the end of the season. Um, we are working with work Business Breakfast with the, with the Horford Oak Company for the business community of Foxton, um, and we're also trying to pull all the other groups together, the disparate groups around Foxen together, so we can work together and get proper community feeling. Uh, I mentioned equestrians need consideration. That also comes back a little bit later on under, under your aspect with the land transport area, because equestrians in Foxton are quite a large proportion of our community. They most of them have land, they, most of them spend a lot of money on keeping their horses, but they've got nowhere to walk them, right? And one of the big problems with Foxton is that the berm, uh, a lovely berm around most of the town, but it keeps getting cut off by the farmers to graze, <laughs> and so the horses can't use the berm. So it's an interesting one. And the Foxton East Drainage Scheme, let me just say there is major disconsent about that. Um, even Horizon's talking about a 50-year flood protection proposed when Palmerston the North has a 200-year flood protection proposed and the Prime Minister on television talking about government was talking about a 500-year protection and we're having trouble getting 50 years for Foxton. There's an awful discontent there. So that's a bit of the base up on my report. Thank you very much. There, there are strong areas which we'll be coming back to you about later on. Thanks, John. Any questions for John on this report? Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Uh, could I just move 2.1, 2.2, that the report be received and uh, not recognised as, uh, uh, be recognised as not significant in terms of 776 and 76. Um, moved by Councillor Jennings, seconded by Councillor Olson. All those in favour? Against? Carry. Thank you, John. You may. Councillor Tilford, did you have a question? I just have a question of, of, of officers. Certainly. Yeah, and that was just around um, the expected time we might receive that proposal on the Foxton Memorial Hall. Like, we've been waiting for a while. 
Uh, through you, Your Worship, uh, so uh, Council had made an agreement uh, with that um, Memorial Hall Committee that they were to submit their business case by October last year. Uh, in July of last year, they requested an extension, um, which I provided, a six-month extension, and so they have until the end of March. Uh, and I, we have communicated in formal correspondence that it's our expectation that that be provided at the end of March. Um, I've also signalled that that timing would work well um, given we're going to have a long-term plan amendment process so that if there were any subsequent decisions off the back of that business case that that was able to be advice provided to council. Uh, thank you. So we're now moving to um, our decision-making uh, reports and we're going to move 7.3 uh, as the first item on our agenda, so uh, which is the adoption of the consultation document and associated supporting information for the long-term plan 2021-2041 amendment and annual plan 2023-24. Uh, while uh, David's coming to the table, can I just move 3.1, that the report and supporting information uh, be received and that this matter is recognised as significant in terms of section 76 of the Local Government Act. Moved by Deputy Mayor uh, Allen, seconded by Councillor Jennings. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. Welcome, Doug. Thank you, Your Worship. Good afternoon, Councillors. The purpose of this report is to present the Long Term Plan Amendment to Annual Plan 2324, supporting information and the consultation document for adoption. There is one administrative matter I'll just draw your attention to. Um, earlier, I put a piece of paper with a table on it. Um, there was one table which in the council report when it came through the, the formatting, the agenda formatting process would have been too small for you to actually read. So there's a, a larger copy of that. Um, it relates to section 5.5 of the council report. So apologies that that was a bit small. The long-term plan amendment process has been a process that council's been working on since August last year. And while amending an LTP at the stage of a cycle is not usual, there have been several important reasons why Council has considered it necessary to undertake an amendment. One of the key drivers has been upholding earlier promises made to the community, such as undertaking a rates review of the rating system and how rates are shared across the district. While preparation of this long-term plan amendment started with the previous Council in August, the new and current council has worked steadily on this since November last year, with regular public workshops held as the long-term plan amendment has been developed. In December, a report was brought to council, and at that council meeting, council approved the scope of the long-term plan amendment and provided direction on the rates income increases that rates that officers were to set budgets to. Officers have worked diligently since then to deliver on that direction. In a moment, you'll hear from the Office of the Auditor General, who will speak in detail about the audit process and the impact of legislation changes that were made late last year. Before they speak, I'll make a couple of observations about the development process. The long-term plan amendment process has seen public workshops held throughout the development of the long-term plan amendment. While public attendance at these workshops have been small, it has been a positive step and provided those interested with the opportunity to follow the process. And this has been a change from previous years where many of those sessions would have been held as public excluded briefings. This transparent process for us present the very first budget which showed a rate increase of over 18%. This was not something we've done previously, but we felt it was important to show the community the level of rates increase that we were facing without making any changes through things outside Council's control, such as changing interest rates, insurance and contract rate increases. We believe that the consultation document sets out the information in a way that can help our community understand and engage in these important issues. There will be a variety of engagement opportunities that we really hope the community will take the opportunity to use to engage with you as elected members. This long-term plan amendment process has been more challenging than other long-term plan processes I've been involved in, and that's been because of the uncertainty that arose through a change in the legislation in December last year. What I do want to highlight though is since becoming aware of the impacts of this legislation, officers have been actively working with Audit New Zealand, the Office of the Auditor General, Department of Internal Affairs, LGFA, other impacted councils, 
Taitu Ara and Minister of Local Government to try and remove this uncertainty and identify a pathway forward. I want to acknowledge elected members for their patience and understanding as we've grappled with this uncertainty and for the advice and guidance that they've provided to officers in light of this uncertainty and for their commitment to wanting to do the right thing for the Horofanua community. I do have a final few comments that I'll make, but first I'll hand over to the Officer and Auditor General. Today we have Mark Maloney, Assistant Auditor General for Local Government from the Office of Auditor General. We also have Amanda Gray, the Sector Manager of Local Government Group of the Office of Auditor General, and we also have Clint and Nossi from Audit New Zealand who have been the ones undertaking the audit. So I'll hand over to them and they will speak to, in particular, the audit process and this legislation issue which I have referenced. Uh, kia, kia ora koutou, um, uh, for your worship and, and thank you to elected members um, for the invitation to speak. Um, um, I'm Mark Maloney, I um, head up a local government group at the Office of the Auditor General. Uh, to my left, your right, is Clint Ramu, who actually um, leads the audit on behalf of the Auditor General and signs your audit opinion. And on my right, um, uh, Nossi Toto, who is actually does all the work on the audit, um, uh, is the audit manager. Um, and, and runs the day-to-day -day, day -day audit, and immediately to my right, um, Amanda Gray, who's the sector manager and manages the officer's relationship with council. Um, to kick off, I'm going to ask Clint to talk to the audit process itself, which is now complete, and then I'll make some comments around the issue that David spoke to, uh, effectively the drafting era in the legislation and the transitional arrangements in the Local Government Act, and how that actually impacts on the audit opinion, which is actually really important. Um, I'll come back to that shortly, but I'll first ask Clint to talk to the audit process where we're at. Thank you, Mark. Kia ora. Um, as Mark said, I'm Clint Long. I've just joined the, the, the audit team on the RF and the audit, so not just the long-term plan, but also on the statutory audit. So it's good to be here, and, and thank you for, for allowing us to speak to you today. Um, so the at the moment, we, things are really strange because we're doing your 2022 audit as well as the LTP amendment audit at the same time. Um, the LTP amendment audit is fairly focused. It's on the consultation document because we will issue two audit reports if you like, one on the consultation document and then later, once the consultation process is complete, on the LTP, the amended LTP that will be issued in, uh, hopefully by the 1st of July for you in order to allow you to write. Um, in terms of the audit work it's, uh, as such, um, we, we, again, you're consulting on two things here, yeah? an amendment to your LTP and your annual plan. Our focus is on the LTP amendments. So you'll see in the document that you would have been shared around that it's split into two parts. Um, we, we focused on the LTP amendment items. So that's the landfill, the water, and the rates, if I put it in those three broad categories, uh, which includes the development contributions. The work has been completed um, in anticipation of an adoption today. So we've been working towards today. Um, However, as you've heard, by both Mark and David, legislation has made things a little bit more um, interesting than normal. Uh, so we've had to basically uh, prepare two opinions in the last week, um, which is unusual because we usually only issue one opinion, um, and that's it. Um, so we've done all the work um, and, and started, and we've been having discussions with, with uh, officers around the assumptions, etc. And by the time we got to start the audit, of course, the legislation um, had been enacted in December. And one of my first conversations to Jacinta was to say to her, nice meeting you over the phone, uh, but guess what? I will be issuing you with an adverse opinion on your LTP amendment. Not the greatest way to start a relationship, um, 
but that was the facts in front of us at the moment, as at Monday. Um, so, so what does that mean in terms of the legislation? So the first opinion that we have, we have prepared based on the legislation as it stands now is that council is not permitted to make changes to three water items in the LTP amendment as part of the process or in an annual plan process. Council has done that in terms of the documentation that you've provided to us for audit. And I, my role on behalf of the Auditor General is to opine on that. So the first thing I have to look at is, does it comply with legislation? <coughs> and it clearly did not. Um, so I took it to what we call an opinions review committee at the Office of the Auditor General, which Mark and um, Amanda and a few other smarter people sit in uh, and said, my proposal is that we issue an adverse opinion uh, for one breach of law. The second item um, that we have to deal with is around assumptions. So a key part of the long-term planning process is you make some key assumptions in that document. Based on the information we have available in the legislation passed to date, the government has indicated that assets relating to three waters will transfer come 1 July 2024. So we would expect to see those assets associated, cost and revenue, etc., as part of the amendment process, be excluded from your long-term plan beyond 1 July 2024. Council, uh, council continues to include that. So that was the second issue for me, is that does it represent the, the, um, the latest information available? So on those two bases, we've gone, so there's two legs to the opinion, and I've proposed and took a lot of time to get to writing the opinion eventually, um, that we issue an adverse opinion and it basically saying that the document is not lawful and secondly that it is um, does not take into account the, the current legislation as it stands. So that's the first opinion and for council to adopt today, that's the opinion I will put in front of you for inclusion in your long term plan I mean, uh, or consultation document, sorry. The second option, of course, things unravel very fast. On Monday, Cabinet considered changes to legislation and have put through uh, uh, amendments that's currently going through the House. So we have to consider that. Just in case you ask me what, what's, what would the opinion look like. Um, the second opinion is if the legislation goes through the House, we would then issue a different opinion which takes out the unlawfulness so there's no breach of law this law is amended but will still retain the part relating to key assumptions because you continue to assume that beyond 1 July 2024 you will retain these assets and again it's, an, it's a difference of view if you like between our officers and ourselves because we say we got the information that we think is right officers are saying and they put in it to council that they've got information that they think is appropriate. We think it's a fundamental assumption um, and, and it uh, cuts across your document. It's pervasive and for that reason we will, I have recommended that we also issue an adverse opinion. So that's where we are. I, I'll hand over to Mark to talk about the impacts etc. Um, but happy to take questions after that. Yes, well, thank, thank you, Clint. Um, yeah, as Clint alluded to, there is a, a process in place um, as we speak in terms of a, what I call a legislative fix in the House, um, which will culminate in a royal assent to the fixing legislation taking place next Tuesday. So, um, you know, Council today you know, needs to make a decision about um, do you adopt your LTP amendment today under the current legislation and think about the implications of that and um, the impact of that on the opinion in terms of the amendment being unlawful is actually quite significant and it is actually covered in the covering paper um, under the risks to your decision um, in terms of council needs to consider what does that mean in terms of the trust and confidence in the community in its decision today in terms of effectively um, adopting an unlawful amendment. Um, yes, it is perception, um, but you need to um, consider what is your community's understanding of the issue 
um, reality is for an, we're, we're in an unfortunate situation that um, is actually not your fault and it's not the auditor's fault. It, it is what it is. Um, it is an error, but it is going through a process of being fixed. The community don't necessarily understand the circumstances surrounding that. And I think um, you are looking to engage with your community on a really important, um, significant uh, transaction. Um, and it's really important that your community has trust and confidence in the process that you're undertaking. Um, so if you choose not to defer, uh, sorry, if you choose to defer and adopt your LTP post the Royal Assent next Tuesday, the reference and the opinion to the adoption of the LTP amendment being unlawful effectively goes away. Um, so it, it is quite a significant change in the opinion from our perspective. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to leave it there. Um, I think Clint has really summed up very nicely the difference between the two opinions. But happy to take any questions at all. Thank you, Mark. Uh, thank you, Clint. Um, so, Councillor Jennings, you want to start? I'm going to thank you. Just going to start with the question around if the council table um, decided to. Uh, support the option to defer for that week to mm -hmm. enable the uh, legislative fix to transit the House and receive the Royal Assent. What happens if there is further announcements by government around Three Waters as a policy, um, as a set of policy proposals? Because obviously the government has signalled uh, that there is a reset coming uh, and that the likelihood uh, within that reset package is potentially delay to implementation or, or changes in the way that uh, aspects of the policy might be implemented. And so I'm just thinking, although it's only a week ultimately between now and potentially when this, you know, that, that, yeah, that we're talking possibly a week before we could um, adopt with, the, with the, the altered opinion, if there is an announcement between now and then, what is the impact on the audit opinion then? Because obviously you, you're proceeding on the basis of the information as best you know it, but if that information package changes between now and then, just want to understand the impact. Absolutely. If there's an announcement between now and, 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 and whatever date that council chooses to defer to, um, we, the office, would need to consider what does that mean for your assumption? Because when we look at the assumptions around the legislation, it's based on the best available information we have. Currently, we have a Water Services Entities Act in the House. That is quite clear. Um, leaving aside the drafting here, it is quite clear about the intention. Um, it really depends on the nature of a government policy announcement. And then we'd have to consider the impact of that um, on the audit opinion. It is that it could have the potential to further delay the issue of a, well, there may be further time required to revise an opinion, which then could potentially delay the adoption of our consultation document. So I'm just trying to understand sort of risk around what, you know, all the bands, a very short period, um, uh, but you just want to understand impact because it, because it, that's one of our key concerns, I think, around the table is delay to being able to adopt and therefore flow on delay in terms of going and having that conversation with our community. There, there, is, there, is, a, there is a risk of delay. I would say, and I, I would say it comes down to the, to the nature of the announcement. So if, for example, I'm, I'm speculating purely here, um, so if for example, the government came out at one end of the spectrum and said free waters is off the table. Um, that means you effectively would be receiving a clean opinion because your current LTP amendment assumes you've got free waters through the 10 years. Okay, so that's one end of the spectrum. Um, if the government comes out and announces a delay in the implementation of free waters and say it was for a year, just as an example, I think the impact on the opinion would be quite minimal. We need to be tweaking the words because effectively you are 
um, still reflecting the free water's assets in Europe. So, so it's not it's not a significant change, and I think that would be relatively quick to 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 to. to to, to, to turn around. Actually, both would be relatively quick to turn around. So now that, that I think about it, it's what happens. It, it really depends what happens in the middle, um, you know, in terms of, and, and I can't foresee the future yeah, as to what it could be. Thank you very much. Yeah. Councillor Tamihana. Sorry, Mark, can I just get you to turn your time? Thank you. Uh, um, I suppose my question is sort of similar, but worded a little bit more differently. Um, I suppose the wording I wanted to look at is what is, what level of assurance um, can your office give in terms of if there was, should council consider delaying today's decision for seven days? And then there is, there's been suggested more legislation or change and more government announcements. You know, what level of assurance, or what, what do you do to cover us? Um, because at the end of the day, we, we are the ones that... Um, be burdened by our community that something horrible is going on but I mean what I'm really saying is this is out of our control so where where do you guys front foot it I suppose that, that, that's what I'm looking for what level of it I mean if the recommendations that you're providing today don't come through then where do you front foot for this council that issue in terms of you know now we've got to go back out to our community again and say you know it's changed again we, we, where's that responsibility really lie? That's what I'm asking. Sorry. So I just wondered if you could just clarify the question for me um, in terms of level of assurance. Um, are you saying, perhaps, if, are you are you saying um, if you choose to defer today, um, and then um, the government makes an announcement during the week, um, which is quite unexpected, um, what level of assurance can we give to you that we can turn around? The, our view very, very quickly. I think um, you can take the the, 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 uh, the level of assurance, in fact, that the office is treating this as one of the number one sort of issues across the sector. We've got a few councils out there that are looking to um, uh, go down a similar route to you with LTP amendments. Um, and there is a very highly conscious of a level of uncertainty um, out there in the sector around around free waters reform generally, let alone dealing with this particular issue. Um, uh, so you can take the the, the, the level of assurance me that we will turn it around internally if there was a government announcement very very quickly. Yeah. Can I just add to that? Just, just one proviso. So if if things stay the same, no changes to the documents, etc. What will need to be changed is the opinion that I think we can do in, in a good time. If I ever council decides that now we'll pull out the three waters from after 1 July, if, you know, whatever that the year might be, that will take a bit longer because we would need to audit those assumptions, do some work over it, run the numbers again and make sure. So that will require some audit work, you know. So that's just the one proviso I'll add to Mark's comments. Thank you. Um, it looks like, um, I mean, obviously we've had lots of discussion, lots of emails, lots of talk around the topic and um, tried to explain to councillors as best we can the options that they have in front of us today. Um, and along with the comments from David and Monique, um, you know, really it's going to be up to the table in terms of where we sit. Um, and you're welcome, obviously, to uh, listen to that conversation. Um, and, uh, but thank you very much for your time. We appreciate the amount of work that has gone into this. And I know um, it's one thing um, to actually have items like this identified, but the way that has been responded to in terms of at least keeping us informed and what has been going on is appreciated. Um, and I know um, our chief executive is probably going to get a reputation for making sure that she does get responses quickly and timely. Um, and if that's the outcome of this uh, matter, then that's for our uh, benefit for sure. Uh, but we do really appreciate your time today and thank you uh, for coming to explain your position.
So thank you for just making a couple of closing closing comments. So for, for context, the report that you're considering was prepared probably seven to ten days ago. So there's a couple of things, obviously, as you've heard today, legislation has changed. Uh, so the recommendations in there reflect our understanding at that time. But as you'll appreciate, it's been a fairly fluent situation and that was prepared ahead of that legislation going to uh, select committee. So one aspect I do just need to, I guess, touch on in my report or potentially correct in light of that legislation change is section 5.445. And that's where I had speculated that a change in legislation could enable an adverse opinion to be avoided. Uh, we've had confirmation that even with the legislation change, council would still receive an adverse audit opinion. The key difference though being the change between being an unlawful to a, a lawful adverse opinion. Uh, this, as you've heard, is because that the long-term plan amendment shows three waters beyond 2024. We are aware of the current three waters reform, but have considered that because of the uncertainties associated with the three waters program, including an impending reset by the current local government minister and a central government election later this year, we believe that to do the right thing for our community means showing Three Waters information in a transparent way that allows our community to understand the potential longer term impact and context. In section 5.46, um, I had indicated that there may be a, a longer delay if additional audit work was needed. Uh, what we've understood now and audit have confirmed is that if it was uh, the legislation change goes through, uh, as things stand with no further changes, there would not be uh, additional audit work required. So the delay would be minimal in that respect. So while as officers we're pleased a solution involving fixing the legislation has been identified and is progressing, the timing of it going through Parliament has been too slow. And as a result, Council finds itself in an extremely unfortunate situation and facing a decision today about how best to proceed with the long-term plan amendment. The report is set out with separate recommendations for each of the three key long-term plan amendment issues, and this is to enable elected members to be able to debate and discuss those ahead of this, a decision on the supporting information and the consultation document. For clarity, um, issue one, which is the rates review, Council's preferred option is option two. Um, I just note that wasn't clear in the document and something we can can highlight. All other key issues have the preferred option identified within the, the text. So in a moment, um, Daniel Jacinta and the Chief Executive will all be available to answer questions or clarify matters relating to those three key issues as you, you work through those. And I think as you've identified, it's appropriate to work through those. It would be very helpful to get some decisions on those recommendations. And then obviously you'll make your decision on whether to adopt or not. Thank you. Any questions of any officers in terms of the report? Councillor Proctor. Uh, thanks, Dan. Just a quick question. So your comments on 5.47, you would adjust those in line with the information over last week? I mean, I'm assuming that 5.47, where you say consultation period has a potential to influence the quality of consultation with the community. I'm sure a week's delay would not influence that. Oh, sorry. Yep. Yes, so, so one week's delay, we believe that we could still get to the start of the consultation period in time. What that looks like is that first week of the consultation period where, so we start on the 27th, I think on the Wednesday the 29th, there's a rating review session with the uh, community rate pay groups and things. It potentially means we're coming along to that with our own budget printed versions of that rather than the, the full glossy documents and uh, we will still obviously be able to put things up online um, it will delaying and adopting a bit later does squeeze that period of time to complete some of those processes but uh, wouldn't compromise the overall time frames for consultation as well as that analysis and, and reports to council as part of the decision making process just a follow up question I see the CEO is nodding so I assume that there's no other um, part of this organisation has an adverse effect of delaying for seven days, does it? No, we're, we're one team. We're all on the same page. Yeah, 
just just procedural um, query, um, and that's if we were to delay, um, are we going to just save all these resolution uh, recommendations till then, or could we possibly do three point three and three point four today and leave the rest for next week, or I mean, it just saves time, or maybe not. I don't know. Um, that's certainly the intention to um, to approve the content and the op the preferred options um, for all those topics. Yes. So regardless of whether we um, adopt today or delay, uh, we will still be um, going through each of those items. Yes. Councillor Gibson. My question points to, carries on a little from Sam's question from a timing perspective. Have we been given or can we reach out to obtain reassurance that we will not have an announcement from the local government minister around three waters reform prior to the royal exempt to the legislation that's going through right now? Because fundamentally, logically, I assume that that would not happen, but that to me seems the biggest risk is an announcement that's made on Friday around three orders from the Lord Minister in relation to this matter. And is it right for us to be asking or seeking that reassurance? Yes. Um, through your worship, I, I'm happy to um, s seek some reassurance and have just sent a text message um, to Wellington. Um, but what I just want to offer to Council is a reminder that what we've heard from OAG and Audit New Zealand today is a distinction between lawful and unlawful. And so while, while it matters and... Um, that if there was an announcement between now and next Wednesday, it matters because I think it um, further reminds us about the situation we're in and the vagueness of this policy situation that puts us in a position we didn't ask for. But if the government were to announce a reset that completely changed the underlying assumptions around three waters, I think it is, I'm not going to use the word impossible, but it's almost like, it's very unlikely that there would be legislation attached to that. So we would still be lawful. It would just be about whether we were able to maybe shake off this adverse um, opinion badge, which, um, you know, unfortunately we hold because of the, the underlying assumptions around three waters. So, um, yeah, like I, I, I can attempt to seek some reassurance, um, but I'm not even sure officials would be able to give us that reassurance because at the end of the day, that would be um, government policy. Um, so that's a decision of cabinet. Uh, what I would comment on is uh, Mayor Bernie and I attended rural provincial, not last week, um, but the week before, and the Minister of Local Government, um, so that would have been the 3rd of March when he presented to us, uh, he talked about um, taking something to cabinet in the next couple of weeks that would then have some engagement with the local government sector, but he was anticipating an announcement within a three to four week period. So a three to four week period would take us to either the 24th of March or the 31st of March. But, um, but again, a policy announcement doesn't change the law. What a policy announcement could do is if there was a complete reshift of three waters, change the assumption. Um, but I think the likelihood of that happening between now and next Wednesday is probably unlikely. Um, yeah. Castle Jenks. Mr Mayor, I mean, I'm... I'm pretty keen to keep moving, yes. but but um, uh, you know I think the prudent thing to do is probably defer, and so I'm just wondering whether there is some uh, value in uh, moving at this point a motion along the lines that uh, items three point six and three point seven be deferred 
uh, to our meeting to be convened on Wednesday, uh, 22nd of March. Well, to be considered at a meeting on 22 March. And that would allow us to continue considering uh, 3.3 to 3.5. Um, but then obviously signal at this early stage that we will defer the formal adoption. So, okay. Do I have a second for that proposal? Happy to second that motion. Councillor Boyle, thank you. Okay, so let's just get our wording correct. Yeah, so it'd be something along the lines of, and please jump in um, if, if you've got better, uh, better phrasing, but that uh, recommendation 3.6 to 3.8 be deferred for consideration at a meeting to be convened on 22 March 2023. I think that that captures it. Through your worship, um, Councillor Jennings, were you wanting maybe that resolution um, to acknowledge that that was to allow for a royal assent of a legislative change being introduced into the House? Absolutely, thank you. <laughs> So while that is just being um, properly written up, um, is there any, uh, we've got a mover and a seconder, so I'm happy to just speak really briefly to it, Okay. Um, yep. which is just while that um, yes. being d discussed. But I think, like, I think there's a number of us around the table who are really quite keen to actually just keep going and actually would, um, are, are not... Um, are not too concerned about the uh, unlawful opinion because we know that um, ultimately come point in time when um, we would formally adopt the long-term plan amendment that all of this stuff would have, would have been sorted out anyway. But I think um, based on the discussion today and it is uh, probably the prudent thing to do to, to um, give us uh, ourselves that week uh, to... Uh, to guest, because I think it will be easier also for us to communicate to our community around uh, the the opinion that we do ultimately get if we defer uh, a week uh, and the reasons for it. Um, uh, the the complexity or the, 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 the situation we find ourselves in, which is totally out of our control, and obviously the team at, um, uh, with the audit team, uh, they're just following the law. So I, I think that uh, probably in the circumstances is the prudent thing to do uh, as much as I want to keep going. Um, but, Yes, and I think it's ultimately a, it's almost akin to a procedural motion to lay that portion of the report on the table. But I don't, yeah, the chief executive might have some advice on it.
point of order. So you're saying this cannot be debated, that it's, it is a procedural motion? It's a procedural motion. Okay. So if it is lost, then we go back to it. Against four, 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 reluctantly four, <laughs> um, against, against four. Sorry, the motion is passed. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, in that case, we'll be back here next Wednesday, hopefully, with a uh, piece of legislation that um, is um, according to, um, you know, how we wish, and that it takes note. Um, yeah, look, we'll no doubt debrief that decision at some stage. Um, so, we are now going back to 3.3 um, to... Uh, which is that Horifana District Council approves the content and options proposed for the rates review, noting that option two is the preferred option. Um, does anyone have any questions of officers, firstly, around um, what's contained in that part of the consultation document? Councillor Tukupa. So, should I just, I can go really fast. Uh, no? Okay. Well, so, okay. So, I've got the, in front of me, this is the latest version from late afternoon yesterday. And um, possibly these things have been picked up already. So, I'll go fast. Um, page three, bottom there, says how you can have your day, not say. So, just correct that. Um, on bottom of our third, okay. then, so, sorry, oh. are these related no, to I, the portion of the... Yeah, yeah, I'm getting there. Okay. So, obviously, the drawing things... Oh, no, I've got questions too. Okay. I was just going to. Right. Unless you want me to just go to those. Just go to those. Okay, right. Um, so, yes. on page 17... It mentions um, our proposed change. There's a little green title there, um, which basically captures our preferred option, which then on subsequent pages gives you that graphic version of each option. I hope you're following what I mean. Um, Yet, when we go to the other key issues, we don't necessarily do the same, like it's inconsistent. Um, the blurb ahead of the gra graphical options doesn't state the preferred option in the same way. So, uh, it's, it's kind of a technical thing, but, uh, you know, if you're a reader like me, it makes a difference. Um, and when we, in terms of past consultation documents, it's really quite obvious which is council's preferred option, but it's kind of, it doesn't really, in all of these, doesn't really jump out. It doesn't really get your attention. It's almost like these are the three options and they're 
oh, they look, you know, they're presented well, but it doesn't grab you, which is our preferred option. So, um, and often those that submit, it's because they note first, first and foremost what our preferred option is. And if they don't support it, they make that their some well, generally their primary focus about telling us why it, it shouldn't be, um, and their ideas and their thoughts or um, input towards it if they if do want to support it. Um, and yeah, if I'm just doing the rates part so far, um, when we get to page twenty three. Option two, a rates increase less than um, down in the table. I just wanted to double check where it says reduce funding for community grants to hundred thousand. Um, well, if you're referring to the community grants that we administer for community groups. It's actually 160 um, on the chair of that. And so to take out 200 means you're not reducing, you're ceasing. There is no more. It's a, so the wording needs to change if that's going to stay there. Okay? Yeah. So, um, Councillor Tokopo, your feedback around the preferred option not being clear in the document, that is really valid feedback. Councillor Jennings raised it prior to the meeting and will do some work to emphasise visually that it, that is the preferred option. Um, in terms of your question, uh, I when this was first, um, if councillors kind of remember back to your Excel sheet where you did your little um, Boti, it said reduce funding for community grants and funding. So it wasn't just about grants, it was about also those organisations we might have service level agreements with or we might give funding to. And so what I'm going to suggest is that we add grants and funding arrangements with community groups to the wording. Cool, because I wasn't suggesting remove it altogether, um, just to, to get the wording right with the number right, so it says the right thing. Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll stop there because then it moves on to the landfill. So there you go. The, the, purpose, of, the purpose of that illustration, though, was just to give a steer towards the community as to what options could be considered to reduce rates further. And I think the wording in that piece sort of covers that in terms of where it states, can see examples below how cutting your service will impact rates. So it's not a steer that if you want to drop further, we'll cut community grants. It's just a steer that that's a type of service that might disappear if you wanted a figure lesser than 7.9%. I think what Councillor Tokopo's point is, is hypothetically if the community came back to us and said, yes, please reduce funding by 200k, maybe we've given them the impression that we give way more than 200k and there isn't actually 200k to give because there's only 160k. Mm, so we'll, we'll correct that. Okay, the recommendations on the table. All those in favour? Sorry, was, was there no discussion about? That, I thought that's that was, what we were doing. They thought that was questions. Yeah. Uh, because it hasn't been, haven't been moved. Yeah. Yeah. Well, all I wanted to say was that although um, I'll probably support the, the uh, motion, I do have some reservations about our preferred option um, because for me, um, 
we're talking um, for me the status o, status quo option is uh, probably the best for me right now and and look I want to acknowledge obviously we've done that the team have done a huge amount of work in terms of the rates review uh, we have followed through a commitment that was given to the community around that rates review um, but for me I'm, I have sort of two main concerns around uh, the the proposed approach to a capital value uh, rating approach. First, is I think we're buying a, a, a debate with our community that's probably just not the right time. Um, and um, for me, uh, we are likely to see some really significant change over the next 12 months and across the next couple of years where local, the face of local government might look quite different. And so uh, I, I feel... Part of me says it's just not the right time to be doing this. But the second uh, reason that um, I have difficulty with the capital value approach is um, I, I don't think it... Uh, we've got some real challenges around uh, wanting to encourage and promote land development and growth. And there are uh, some aspects... And, and so that come, coming with that is that there is some certainty provided by a uh, land value-based approach that I think offers more certainty around things like development contributions and some of those other funding challenges, uh, whereas capital value rating doesn't really incentivise and actually can, in some cases, uh, enable that land banking sort of approach across our community. Um, and I guess all I want to say, I mean, like, the, the thing is that no one likes rate increases at all, <laughs> um, and that like no rating system can be ultimately uh, totally fair and equitable and, and meet everyone's expectations. Um, and, and I accept that we, we can't have an approach that's that 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 is yeah ultimately um, that that satisfies everyone. But for me, just today, I just. I, I wanted to flag that I can't support um, the capital value approach being our preferred option. And I know that Deputy Mayor Allen's going to have a really articulate um, response. Before right Deputy now. Mayor Allen, just, can I just second the motion that's been put? Yeah. Um, Deputy Mayor Allen, do you wish to speak? Yeah, thank you. And acknowledge uh, Councillor Jennings' position, which, which he flagged in an open workshop also. Um, I, I just address the the issues that he's raised on the on the question of timing. Um, I guess I, if we believe that capital value in principle is fairer than land value, then the question of timing is irrelevant because it's about what is the fairest system of rating, um, and and the evidence for me points to capital value being a fairer system simply because it is a rating process based on the full picture, not a part of the picture. The challenge around um, the growth issue, land value historically has been the preferred option where councils wish to attract growth because they are desperate for growth to occur. Land value is great that way because it's saying, "Does please come build whatever you want to build because we need more people. We're in the position where growth is inevitable, it's exciting, and it's it's exponential. And therefore, the timing seems right for me in terms of capital value because the growth scenario is, is no longer a deterrent to capital value. I'm not sure what Councillor Jennings meant by uh, the changes to local government, which he referenced, so I can't, can't offer any opinion on that. But for the reasons I've given, I'm firmly supportive of capital value being the preferred option, acknowledging that we are then going to go into listening mode. And I know that Councillor Jennings and I will share equally a lack of predetermination when it comes to hearing what the community has to say. Councillor yeah, Olsen. Yep, um, I'd take everyone else's opinions, but... Um, Although I do support the options on the table, I obviously don't um, support option two as a preferred option either, um, given probably my background um, and just the uncertainty around three waters. So, um, so I won't support. Councillor Olsen. Um, thank you. Um, just noting that I will be um, supporting uh, this. We made a, um, 
a commitment to our community that we would discuss and um, the rating issue. Uh, last term was very much about um, ensuring uh, that affordability and equity was a topic of rates debates uh, continually um, and in fact was the reason that was uh, proposed for the minus 1.83% rate decrease that we did. It was all about um, the affordability issue and after the revaluations that we've experienced over the last six years, the landscape has changed. It's a completely different landscape in terms of land value, capital value basis I believe, and that conversation needs to be had with our community. I expect plenty of opposition to it, and I welcome it, um, because the debate needs to be had, and so I'm comfortable in terms of supporting um, capital value, because I think that will engender the most uh, response from our community. Um, so, happy to do that. So, anyone else wish to um, put an alternate view? Okay, motion's on the table. All those in favour? Against? To Councillor Boyle? I'm for. Thank you. So the motion is carried. Thank you. Uh, moving to um, 3.4. The Horofner District Council approves the content and options proposed for the future of the Levin landfill. Sorry, uh, noting... Option two is the preferred option. And if you're not entirely sure what option two says, it says can keep the Levin landfill closed with revenue generated from alternative site use determined through the waste minimisation management plan development. You have a mover. Moved by Council Proctor, seconded by Council Tokapua. No. No, no just a question. Do I have a second to that? Councillor Tomiana, thank you. Yes. Okay, right. I'll just hold in abeyance. The, the, yeah, no, that's all right. We do need to follow due process. Um, so I'll just uh, hold in abeyance. That's how I'll ask that question again. Council Tupu, do you have a question? Yeah, it's just on page 27. I wondered, well, to me that reads false. Um, the last, um, second to last sentence where it's in reference to the remediation of the old dump, um, the false part, it says mm -hmm. that has been underway for years. I think we only recently made that decision to do the remit, so just need to delete that. I'm, I would ask the question that whether we have we have been trying doesn't mean to say that we haven't completed or finished, uh, but we have been trying and attempting for some years. Is that correct, Daniel? Can you just confirm for me and for the public, Bree, and what specifically um, would you say we've been doing for years on the remediation of the old dump? I mean, but some pieces of nothing significant, I guess. Okay. Um, yes, so prior to Christmas. 15th of December's decision was around commitment to a program of remediation works. Um, some of those will come back through the OPR to provide an update. Um, so it has been a significant push um, from this council to, to commit to uh, investigating and commissioning remediation works. Um, obviously, um, you know, that will require some enduring commitment of this council and, and subsequent councils to continue with that. So, so, so just through the worship, through you, Your Worship, I think when Daniel said yes, Daniel was agreeing with Councillor Tukapua. Um, we, 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 the remediation program until the last few months has not had the focus that it should have. And I think that's the point Councillor Tukapua is making.
Any further questions? Okay. Put the motion back on the table. Uh, moved by Councillor Proctor, seconded by Councillor Tamihana. Thank you. Any further debate or discussion? There being none, I'll put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Councillor Boyle, can you just signal to me, please? Four. Thank you. Okay, moving to 3.5. Any questions of that the Horofuna District Council approves the content and option proposed for key water infrastructure? Have we got a preferred option in that space? Option one, which is um, increased budget to deliver the projects we need. Questions, Councillor Tukapu? Yeah, apart from the um, quote on page 38, which reads a bit clumsy to me, um, the only other thing I need to check is on the bottom of page 43. Does that repeat itself three years and then three years, or am I reading that wrong? Oh, yeah, approximately three years. I'm having trouble following your number. Um, page numbers on the... On the, on the, um, on the, the supplementary, um, it's not got a page number on it, could you? Um, oh, okay, sorry. Um, page option one, increase the budget to deliver oh. the projects we need. Down the bottom, rates impact over three years and over the next three years. I'm like, well, yeah. what is it, that or both? It's double up, we'll fix it. Make my screen make it helps. Any further questions? House of Jenning. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, it's just in relation to a question around uh, the water meters, leak detectors. So I just wanted to understand that um, the proposal around option one involves uh, installation of those uh, of the meters within uh, the 23-24 financial year. So can I clarify that, and then I've got a second question. I'd seen earlier documentation where it says that we would be taking two to three years to install water meters. Through your, your worship. Uh, so that will come back through a separate uh, business case, uh, including the options around the type of meters. So the the current meter arrangement, um, you know, the cost could be in the vicinity of, of $1 million, but if we were to go to the smart meters, that was effectively the worst case scenario that was modelled through the LTP. So there would need to be a subsequent decision of council post community feedback on the on the metering uh, before we land that business case uh, around committed options to, and, and timing for that. So we'd come back with that guidance for a separate paper post consultation. But just to answer Councillor Jennings' question, it's unlikely to be in the 23-24 financial year. It would go. It, it would be spread probably over two years. Yeah, yeah. But we could come back pretty quickly. Forty percent of the district's already metered. Um, it's a fairly straightforward process. It would come down to materials availability and ultimately that um, decision around the type of meters that would, would require a lead in time. So, Councillor Jenny, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, so, I've got a further question. I just need to sort of have a bit of a preamble, though, if you don't mind. Which is, I think that one of the one of the things you do mind. Um, um, well, look, the, I think one of the issues is that I'm concerned that this will be a really controversial issue for our community. And so I suspect, however, one of the questions that might be generated through consultation process is, so what happens if there's a, if I find a leak on my, if there's, it's established there's a private leak on my, oh, there's a leak on my property, if this, if I was to support this option and uh, there was a leak found on my property, then the property owner wears that cost. And I think that that will be a significant concern for many out there in our community, that all of a sudden there's a massive financial shock on a household to address a private issue. And so I've already had a conversation with the um, with Jacinta about 
um, the, the potential need for us to look at some sort of targeted rate or some sort of approach that allowed uh, where an issue is identified uh, on a private property that perhaps there is a mechanism by which um, council could pay the upfront cost of that and then it's recovered through rates to soften that impact on a household. And so my question really is, my question to Jacinta was, if that was something that we were interested in putting in place, do we need to be flagging the the financial impact or the you know potential scope of that or that in this document? And I think the messaging back was no, but um, is there some cons that could sit alongside this about what actually happens if, if there was support for water meters, what do we envisage would happen if people find a leak? Because I think that's an important part of the of the conversation. So, uh, you know, is, is there something we can do around the, the comms around that? And how could we um, potentially build sort of a, a targeted rate approach or something into what the, the back end of, of this looks like? Sorry, that's not a very articulate question, but I think you get the general gist. Through you, Mr. Mayor, this, in regards to the comments, a number of councils do have um, targeted rates that they offer for things like water tank purchases, um, home insulation, and different options of that nature. So there is no reason why we couldn't explore it. What I talked to Councillor Jennings about this morning is from a setting up a targeted rate perspective, it's a bit, it's too late for this round. Uh, but it's absolutely something that we could look at in, for the long-term plan. In terms of messaging, there's no reason why we couldn't signal that that's something that we would look at, the council was keen to look at in a future year, but it wouldn't be something that would be set up for next year. Any further questions? Okay, so could I have a mover and a seconder for that? 3.5, the Rofano District Council approves the content and options proposed for key water infrastructure, noting option two is the preferred option. Moved by Deputy Mayor Allen, seconded by Councillor Horridge Park. Any further? Was it option two or one? Uh, one. Sorry, my apologies. Option one. <laughs> not option two, uh, which option one is to increase the budget to deliver the projects we need. Um, any further debate or discussion? All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Yes, we did. Councillor Allen, Councillor Horridge. Uh, sorry, uh, Councillor Boyle, you might have been a delay there. Were you for that? I was for that motion. Yep. Thank you. Um, the motion is carried. Thank you. We've dealt with 3.6 to 3.8, so that is the topic. Just, or has someone got? Can I just say, so is D, was DCs covered by rates review? Because that's obviously, I've treated that as a separate issue, but... If I've missed the boat, then I've missed the boat. Uh, I think that um, that the intention is that it's not an, it's not really captured in the LTPA; it's the annual plan. But if council felt, well, yeah, look, I've actually only got a question. I haven't got any discussion or debate around it. So can I just to clarify that? So um, on page, um, and I foreshadowed this to um, Jacinta on page fifty three. Um, we're obviously signalling some significant um, increases uh, in DCs for Waitangi Beach and uh, Oho. Um, and so it was that third column from the end. And just to get an explanation around where we're obviously referencing what the current DC is uh, and that the new DC is actually lower than the current DC, but there's an explanation for that. And I just wanted to see if Jacinta was happy to explain that to the to the table and potentially for the benefit of the public. Through Mr Mayor, so we'll double, um, I'll double check before, but essentially in the last long-term plan, the development contribution for Oho specifically included 
um, the cost of water and wastewater as well. Um, so that previous column is including it, and that's that's why it looks like it's dropped. I think what we'll do is make sure that we're adding some clarification so that that's really clear for the reader. Are you comfortable with that response? Yeah, cool. Um, Councillor Jennings has brought up the amount of uh, the topic of development contributions. Is there anything else in the document that people wish to highlight, change, or propose different thoughts there? Councillor Tommy Hanna. Uh, I'm not going to be specific, but I'm certainly going to border on the line of languaging. I think it, people are quite relevant to what I'm probably raising there. Just, just those other minor tweaks, I'll just take that to, yeah, no yep. content. Yeah, yeah, just, yeah, yeah, sure. So. Yep. Um, what I suppose I'm just asking is that um, following the legal um, change that we're expecting in the next few days, when everyone arrives next Wednesday, that they're comfortable with all the other matters that are contained in the consultation document, that the only decision then will be about adopting the full document and noting the obvious order opinion. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thank you. Right. Um, now, look, I'm just proposing that we deal with 7.1 and 7.2 quickly, and then we will have a short break. So um, 7.1 is the adoption of the Horofano District Council Governance Statement 2022-2025. Uh, could I move 3.1, 3.2, uh, that the governance statement be received and the matter is recognised as not significant in terms of Section 76 of the Local Government Act. Uh, move Councillor Jennings, uh, seconded Councillor Grimstone, all those in favour? Against Kerry. So, uh, Chief Executive would like to introduce this topic. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, councillors, uh, this is a requirement under the Local Government Act. Uh, none of the content within the governance statement should feel like a surprise because it's essentially a collation of everything that you have decided and given direction on since the election. Um, uh, and just noting that obviously council are required to, within six months of a local body election, adopt a governance statement, and so that is why we are bringing it to you for adoption. Happy to answer questions. Are there any? A statement. Well, just a, a point of view. Point of view. Just point. Deputy Mayor Allen, no, no, just give your point of view. Thank you. No, just to acknowledge this document, although it has existed in the past, it now has profile. And, and at the heart of it, it's, it's telling the public not only how we work as a council, how we do business, but most importantly, how the public can engage with us. So it is an important document, and it's good that it's, it's got some profile. Councillor Tukupa. Just a minor editing on page 65, which I can give the detail later. Yeah, and just to apologise that we didn't identify within the governance statement that Councillor Tukupoa is the chair of the Community Grants and Funding and Recognition Committee. Um, so um, that will be corrected ASAP. I think this is just another step, ensuring that our community... Um, can see that we are open and transparent and that um, we're not trying to hide anything or do anything. Uh, sometimes we get accused of um, occasionally. Councillor Tukupu? I could have asked this offline, but um, the last time I actually asked in a meeting about the or raised the community connection, which is featured in the Chronicle, I was told that... Um, at some point soon that was ceasing or um, things were changing potentially the way we but it's still there i'm happy to see it. it's still there is, is that change not occurring now or are we doing different or? um so community connections and ssp and our long-term plans so we need to continue to deliver it in some form um 
obviously there's a significant amount of work happening across our comms and engagement team. Um, but if anything was to change, it's about the how regular it is. So I think that um, we're working towards having it a bit more regular than monthly, um, but not not weekly. And in fact, that's already started. It's too weekly now. Yeah. It's just trying to manage expectations. Well, <laughs> so. I know, just added more workload um, for some people as well. Uh, anyway, um, Kirsten. Uh, yeah, Mr. Mayor, just acknowledging that there is um, an item on the uh, agenda today which is proposing a change to the terms of reference for the Risk and Assurance Committee. I just wanted to make sure that in approving the governance statement now, that that can automatically be updated if there is a change, or does that require a further amendment, you know, a further resolution? Um, because it makes sense to potentially consider the other matter first um, so that we can capture any change and then it's we're adopting the statement and not having to come back. Yeah, through you, Your Worship, good point, Councillor Jennings. I wonder whether, assuming Council's going to consider this resolution, whether it would be helpful to add an additional resolution, which is to give delegations to the Chief Executive, should there be any amendments to content associated with the governance statement that we're able to do that and republish the document? Because, yes, there's the terms of reference today you're considering. There'll be future changes. So um, the motion with that addition uh, addition is can I add that into the, with the wording that the chief of the had? challenge for the meeting secretary to um, <laughs> to add um, that. Sorry, we haven't moved um, three point three yet. And gives delegation to the chief executive. All those yeah, yeah, as yeah. and when required. So um, three point three will now read that in accordance with section forty in brackets, one of the Local Government Act 2002, the Council adopts and makes publicly available the governance statement for the 2022-2025 triennium as attached in Appendix A of this report and gives delegated authority to the Chief Executive to alter the terms of reference. Just to make amendments. To make amendments as required. As, and we require. Moved by Councillor Jennings, seconded by Councillor Olson. Any debate or discussion? Put the motion. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. And 7.2 on page 85, appointment of Register of Pecuniary Interest and noting of Pecuniary Interest Register. Um, again, move 3.1, 3.2. To that this report be received and is recognised as not significant. Uh, moved by Councillor Jennings, seconded by Councillor Horry Power. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Um, again, I'll ask the Chief Executive to introduce this topic. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Uh, Councillors, uh, you'll note legislative change came into force on the 20th of November um, 2022, and this report seeks to ensure that. We've met our legislative responsibilities um, with a formal appointment of a registrar. Um, I do want to bring to your attention um, what I would note uh, is some inconsistency in the way members have declared question seven. Um, uh, and so just want to remind members that uh, question seven should, it is your responsibility as members to declare any appointments that you hold by virtue of being an elected member. Um, and while it might seem kind of annoying that as staff, given we know what you've been appointed to, that we can't just write it in for you, it's not appropriate for us to do that. As the member, you must declare your conflict. Um, uh, and also would just um, reiterate that obviously following this meeting, I'm sure a number of you will declare 
um, some additional things associated with um, your role as an elected member, it doesn't require us to bring it back to council. Um, so actually the core decision you're making today refers to the resolutions, but what we've done in the interest of transparency is make sure that we've had this on public record, but uh, as you know, um, this goes on our website and whenever as an elected member you update an interest, uh, so will the register that um, sits on our website. Happy to answer questions. Any questions? Councillor Rolls. What just changes there, um, Monique, to who's this person to talk to, Jodie? Yeah, so all changes if we put it through the democracy team. Yep, uh, and if you're seeking, if you're wanting some advice because you're unsure about a particular interest, um, you're welcome to come and discuss that with me. Well, um, oh, sorry, um, through the mayor. Uh, just a question for me is, um, I suppose you know, I'm in, I'm, I'm out there in a lot of different places and spaces. Does that also include if you're um, on committees, not in the council role, um, but council are, on, are involved in those committees? Um, so, if you're not there by virtue of an elected member, then um, under this, you're not required to declare it. But my advice to any elected member is always going to be on the, to err on the side of caution uh, and to, um, whether it's a procuratory interest or not, um, if you name it, then we can give advice around how we can, um, how as a member you can best manage that conflict. Can we fire for an example? <laughs> yeah, it's, absolutely. So I'm just thinking with Mr Russell's presentation this morning around the water tertiary management. Um, team, so I'm there also, um, but as Hapu, and so there's no other matter than I just sit in on the meetings. Um, and so, like hypothetically, if that example was to come to me, what I would say is, well, that um, that group and the work associated with managing our statutory responsibilities to the Ramsar site. Uh, has council funding attached to it, so therefore you would declare it under question six. I think the other thing that it clearly signals is that when we're seeking conflicts of potential conflicts of interest on any matter, that the community interest the register will clearly establish whether there is that conflict of interest or not. So it just you know gives some clarity around um, your ability or your um, whether you think you should be declaring or not. So, um, moving to um, 3.3, that council appoint the chief executive as the registrar of pecuniary interest for Orphano District Council to maintain the register of members' pecuniary interests. Do I have a move? Moved by Councillor Jennings, second by Councillor Horry Parr. Any further discussion? All those in favour? Against? Carried. Thank you. And 3.4 that Council note that the 2023 Orphanage District Council Register of Pecuniary Interest will be published on the Council's website. Again, I, I assume that that is a requirement. Yes, we just motion that Okay. Moved, Councillor Denning, second, Councillor Horrid Park. All those in favour? Against, carried. Thank you. So that brings us to the end of our decision making uh, reports. Uh, we do now, um, sorry, we need to go to 7.4 first. Uh, 7.4 is. The Risk and Assurance Committee Amendment of Terms of Reference. This report seeks council approval to amend its terms of reference to increase the membership of the Risk and Assurance Committee from seven to eight members and further appoint Councillor Tukupo to the committee. Can I move 3.1 and 3.2 that the report be received and recognised as not significant? Councillor Young, seconded by Councillor Jennings. All those in favour? Against? Carried. So, um, 
we have 3.3 and 3.4. Are there any questions, Councillor Jennings? No, I was just going to signal Mr Mayor that I was happy to move 3.3, um, 3.4. Um. Okay, so I've got a mover. Is there a second, Councillor Olson? Thank you. Any further discussion? Just a flag that, um, that look, uh, I think um, the, the various reasons for the changes are captured in the report paper, but it would be um, our pleasure and honour to have um, Councillor Tukapua as part of the Risk and Assurance Committee. We think she'll be a great addition. So, thank you. Urge members to support. Um, just cancel, tell me how. Um, no, I support what's been spoken of too. I suppose the only thing I was considering in that space was um, whether one of the other members could have retired actually um, to allow Councillor Tukapua to go on. And the reason I say that is because you're going from seven to eight, um, which in terms of voting and what have you um, becomes an issue. So that, that's the only point I wanted to share. Otherwise, happy to support. Thank you, Councillor uh, Tamina, because it was a, uh, it, it is a, a consideration that, um, you know, the whole purpose of having a risk insurance committee is that uh, it's compact and it's, um, you know, concise and, and with our two independent members, um, you know, that it is uh, a really, um, you know, an opportunity to be, um, to dig into some of those big issues uh, in a, not a full council um environment but uh, in saying that I don't want to preclude any member who wishes to become a member of the committee uh, who shows an interest in being contributing to that uh, however uh, there may well be that consideration needed in terms of uh, any request along those lines um, so um, 3.3, that council amends its terms of reference to increase the membership of the Risk and Insurance Committee from 7 to 8, and 3.4, that council appoints Councillor Perihara Tukapua to the Risk and Insurance Committee for the remainder of the 2022-2025 triennium. I assume Mr. Councillor Jennings is moving that, um, seconded by Councillor Young. Any further discussion? Put the motion, all those in favour? Sorry, did I just... Against? Carried. Okay, so we will now be moving to um, item 8.1, but I am going to uh, adjourn the meeting for uh, until 5 o'clock so that we can have a bit of a break. Thank you.
Are we on um, back on live stream, Jody? Thank you. Um, so just um, thank you. Um, we will now recommence our meeting. And uh, we're now on page 129, the organisation performance report. So can I move 2.1, 2.2, that the report be received and recognised as not significant? Uh, Councillor Olsen, Councillor Jennings, uh, all those in favour? Against carried. Thank you. So I will ask um, the Chief Executive to introduce the report. Um, and just as I indicated earlier, we're going to ask each of the activity managers to um, be available to answer questions or comments around the report. Um, so over to the Chief Executive. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm actually going to take the report as read um, because the GMs are all ready to um, answer any questions that you might have. But I am going to ask uh, Jacinta just to take you through a four-page presentation. Um, I, I'm really conscious that the OPR is obviously a sizable document. There's a lot in there. It is a core way in which we present financial progress, though, and um, I do want to make sure that we are highlighting uh, those areas of, um, of significance that we think elected members should be focusing on. And so just is just going to um, pick up on a few key things that we want to make sure elected members understand. While you do that, just, in a, just reminding the table that the figures contained in this report are to the 31st of January. Um, so, yeah, just remember that. Thank you through you, Mr. Mayor. So there are a few key things in the report and some of the questions that came through, I think, highlighted um, to me in particular that we need to adjust the way that we're report reporting to help make things more clear um, and, and break down some of the information a bit in a bit more transparent or not transparent, but clear way for you all in the future. So one of those items was specifically around our deficit. So for the council, when we set the annual plan for 22-23, we set a budget, and this just is to show you in, in, in a picture format, we set a budgeted deficit which sat at about $12 million. That's now forecasting to be just above $13.5 million. So what I want to do is just talk you through what that means, what, how, why was that set, and then what, what does that look like in the future. So firstly... When we set that budget, there are key, three key reasons why we have an operating deficit. So one of those is around the decision to not fully fund depreciation. So within when we set the budget, there was a level of unfunded depreciation that was about $7.4 million. So that's that green part of the box there, or green part of the bar. Also, there's about $4 million worth of spending that we call basically debt-funded operational costs. So what that means is it shows up as a deficit in terms of the operating results, but what it's for things like the district plan specifically and for some of the decisions that were made around the landfill in the past where there was a significant increase in the cost of the landfill, both for recycling in the past and also for the change that we've made recently in terms of waste going to Bonnie Glen, that rather than cause that increase to occur all in one year and fund that through rates, the, the decision was made in setting the annual plan budget that it was more reasonable that that cost was spread over a number of years. So while it will be funded over a period of years, the district plan is 10 years, and in the, in the case of, of solid waste, it's three to five years. But in a particular year, when you're looking at the costs and where they sit, it will show up as an operating deficit in that year. The other thing is around interest savings. <laughs> it's hard to believe when, you, when you're sitting in the seat that you're in now, that when, for the period last year, we had a, we, because we didn't spend the level of capital that we thought we would, we had some interest savings um, as part of that. And so the conversation was, it wouldn't be reasonable and fair for the ratepayers that paid those rates not to have that benefit future years. So that effectively was a decision that was made as part of that annual plan to help offset the cost in this financial year. So that's what that bit there means. So that is essentially what makes up the operating deficit that was part of the budget. 
Now the question in the long term plan, oh, sorry, in the in the budget now, um, is that we are facing as we as we've talked about some significant cost pressures, and those are ones that have that we've talked about through the long term plan amendment process as well, and they are interest, insurance, and in the three water space, the maintenance costs. So at this stage, the the operating deficit could be 1.5 to 1.6 million dollars more. Um, than we had budgeted, and it's for those key reasons. We're doing all we can through regular reviews to see if there's places that we can trim costs, and the more we, the absolute, we'll absolutely do that as we can. But at this stage, we wanted to flag early that that's some pressure that we're facing in that space. Another thing that this picture shows to you is if you look at the green line um, in terms of the that goes up here, this is the total depreciation that the council has. So between the green bar and the line is effectively the level that we do fund. So you can see even though, for example, as we move into the LTPA budget, where we actually have a significantly lower operating deficit than we have in the past, while the funded depreciation or the unfunded depreciation, pardon me, looks about the same, the level of depreciation that we are incurring is significantly higher. So we're actually choosing to fund a lot more and that's a key reason why um, we are facing the challenges around rates. We did change that so initially in the original long-term plan that would have been a lot lower um, but the decision at this table was made um, to keep that fairly even. So that, does anyone have any questions about that one before I move on to the next bit? Councillor yeah, Olsen. Yeah, I'm just sorry. Thanks, Jacinda. I, just for um, additional interest costs on that in, in um, 2024, have you like what sort of rates are you? Are you like, you're obviously going to have increased interest rates for the next year or so before they come back down, but that's not sort of reflected in that graph. Is that right? It's a good question. So within the budget that we have set, that's already factored in the additional interest costs. Although. Um, we need to keep a monitor on it and, and see how the economy is moving. And relative, we've, we've gone sort of at 3.75, 3.8 is the level we've assumed in the budget. Um, so as we monitor things and where they sit, um, we'll have to keep assessing as we come back from consultation whether that still looks reasonable. So there may be some pressure in the longer term if things continue to push up. Yep. Next is the capital program. So you'll have the steering group around capital coming up. We'll get into the projects in more detail. But just to highlight today that from a capital perspective, at the end of January, we had completed 15.5 million. I thought it might be helpful just to give you a view of what the results into February look like. So that's sitting at 17.5. So a further 2 million spent in February. There is still a lot of work to be done to get to the $35 million that we've assumed from a budgeting perspective, um, but the team are working hard to assess what's achievable, and that will come back in a future report once more details um, understood with the team. So I'll leave it at that, and if, um, if you've got specific questions um, that can either come through that um, review group or through Dan as part of going through some of the, the items today. I might just ask a general question if it's okay, Ms. Mayor. Um, just in relation to this um, slide, Jacinta, um, I'm interested if you could just provide just a general overview of the labour recoveries component of capital spending, because obviously there's some messaging in the in the report around that we're actually tracking behind, but it's because we're we're tracking behind um, the budget in terms of um, the actual ca capital spend at this point. But I presume that the the f the full amount of um, Labor recoveries is against the thirty-five million figure rather than the higher forty-five million dollar total program figure for the year. It is against the thirty-five, and um, I want Dan, Daniel and his team have been working really hard on getting updated in terms of updating that work in terms of what time has everybody spent on which projects to try and get that in soon for the next report. It is assuming the thirty-five million. Um, but it's just making sure that when we do it, it's it's um, justifiable and reasonable in terms of the levels that we're putting to capital. Yeah. And and so sorry, just to validate that. So what it means is that if any number of capital spend under the thirty five million, potentially means that there's a portion of a fixed 
staff cost that's going to be that needs to be met through an operational budget because it's not being recovered through a capital line is that i mean is that i'm trying to break it down really simply but yeah in theory but that's also balanced with the um assumption around um, staff vacancies as well and we've certainly experienced a, a higher level than what was sitting in the original assumption so looking to bring back a nine month update so at the end of march uh, fully conclusive sort of accurate picture of where we are um staff numbers projected through the end of financial year um, so we'll give you a pretty good picture alongside an update for the capital work program And the last bit here is just around our borrowings. So what I wanted to make sure we do on a regular basis is give, give you the view of our borrowings as it's tracking now. So what I've given here is a view of what our borrowings were as we reported in 2022 and then ongoing um, in, through the LTP and the numbers that we set. The dark green um, is the three waters borrowings. So at any point you can see what that looks like in the debt settlement meetings that we've recently had uh, with the National Transition Unit, that 60.3 or $60 million um, is a level that the NTU are comfortable with verbally in terms of the debt that should Three Waters go ahead would be the level that they would be comfortable um, in passing over to us, albeit at a point in time it would be a staged payment rather than on day one, which is something that's new and needs to be worked on further. Um, as well, so we had 124 million, what that top line shows you is what the gross borrowings look like. So at this stage, um, we're anticipating it will get potentially up to around 138 or 140 million in terms of gross borrowings. The difference between the, the staggered line there and the, the bar is effectively the cash that we hold um, and the investments that we have with local government funding agency. So when we talk about net borrowings, it's our total gross borrowings, which is this level, less any cash and direct investments that we've got with the local government funding agency. So that gives a view of, of what the borrowings look like as well. Thank you, Jacinda. Um, look, and there will be an opportunity, obviously, to ask Jacinda any questions when we get to the financial um, summary as well. Um, but my intention pretty much is to go through this activity by activity so that if you've got questions or comments and obviously the different reports are probably spread across all the, the um, GMs so um, just really an opportunity to ensure that we're across everything that is going uh, on in the organisation. So uh, let's kick off with um, the health and safety report. Are there any questions or issues that people want to bring up? Okay, moving to the property um, report, and maybe I could start with asking around the, the ladies, ex-ladies bowling club rooms. I had had some previous um, thoughts that this was going to be some sort of garden or something like that, but it looks like we're now going out to the community to um, can consult on that. Uh, thank you, um, Mibini. I might defer to um, our Parks and Property Manager, uh, Mr Nelson, for um, for that one, if you don't mind. Yeah, just... Sorry. Just on, on that, um, through you, your worship, um, the comment about the community is more about just seeing this, if there's anything else that comes out of that discussion. So... The essence of this is still as we described. Um, it will be a uh, small event lawn and um, uh, gardens and picnic lawn. Uh, but we obviously will go out through things like Facebook just to see if there's any other uh, interest in that. But it won't be a full scale community um, uh, consultation. Cassa uh, On page 142, I just want to acknowledge your support for. Fayoro Trust. They are a member of the Horofenua Youth Services Network and um, 
most of us will know that their premises or the Roko are building on Keep Street burnt down last year, which they occupied, and so they had to find somewhere pretty desperately because they're working with young ones. And um, yeah, they're in a spot, and you're providing further assistance, which I just want to say thank you. Yes, please take the opportunity, councillors, if you wish to acknowledge the work that is going on. I'm sure the GMs would like to pass that on to their teams. Um, one question I had uh, was around earthquake-prone buildings, and I suspect that, that this is going to be a significant issue over the next little while, and I wondered whether um, council... You know, what is the timeline for us to actually get an update on where we sit with not only the, the halls, but also some of the other uh, properties that are, um, you know, are concerned with this? Uh, thank you, Your Worship. And I just want to um, make a couple of comments in relation to the OPR um, around the um, comment around the halls. Um, um, I just want to reassure Council that we are meeting all our obligations under the Act at present. Um, we do have signage up. We are um, we have all the buildings classified and have been assessed. Um, in terms of a future report, um, we can do some work and bring that back to Council um, um, for, a, for a future um, OPR or, or a dedicated briefing, if, if that's the desire from the table. Thank you. Okay, moving on to community. Oh, Councillor Tommy Hunter. Yeah, I just wanted to ask a question actually around some of those buildings. So, um, I, I understand that there's potential that um, one of the halls could be looking to be uptaken by a community group. Um, and so I'm just sitting here as I read through this, seeing that it actually notes that people may not be able to um, find the money to do the earthquake prone work that's required for those buildings. So my question is, if council okay. entertain going through with a process of, of um, giving a group the A building, would the intent that that work would happen? If it doesn't happen, will that building come back to council? So um, through your worship, without kind of predetermining a position council might take on said building, um, I, I, there are mechanisms, legal um, or otherwise, that we can use to put assurances in place around the use of the building. Um, so whether the building is gifted or whether the, guilt, the building is um, given um, could depend on the sort of assurances that um, we could seek around that earthquake strengthening and what would happen if that building wasn't strengthened. Um, of course, part of kind of council's approach around those buildings that they consider no longer um, required because um, for a range of reasons, including the concern about the ongoing liability, about it being earthquake prone, that's something council would want to consider about, well, would you want it back? I suppose my answer to that is the land is still valuable. And those are the things that council will be able to consider as you know particular decisions come up. For example, a decision around the Foxton Memorial Hall, which will be coming up in the next month or so. Sorry, uh, moving on. Uh, community facilities and services. Any questions there? Councillor Jennings. Um, yeah, just a question, and I foreshadowed this um, um, before the meeting, which was just around later in the report, um, we've got the SSPs, and one of the um, measures is around visitor numbers to our community facilities, um, and, and they're sort of around, I, think, I suspect that they'll be around about 50% of what the SSP level is at the moment, uh, it, it, the target for the, for the year, and the question really was, are the SSPs um, set too high? Have we been too ambitious? And do we need to potentially review them as part of the uh, long-term plan proper? Uh, or are we, you know, is there, is there a need to think about, well, um, what does that mean for our facilities if we're not hitting the level of 
uh, numbers of people coming through the doors, what does that actually mean in terms of, of the level of service that we're actually providing? Um, through you, Your Worship. Um, those SSPs were obviously set um, at the last LTP, and at the time, um, it was sort of just at the start of, of COVID. Um, COVID has significantly impacted our, our numbers through our facilities, and at the time of setting them, they were uh, stretch targets, I guess you'd say. Um, so to answer your question, I think there is an opportunity to reset them, um, and of course, as part of part of that, we'd, we'd look at what the numbers are through through the door and, and how we offer our services. I just had a follow up question. Sorry. Sure. Did you? Through your worship, just reminding councillors that this was obviously raised at the last meeting, um, and Councillor Tokapua requested some additional information about patronage and whether that was a trend that we were seeing across New Zealand. And um, Mr. Harvey circulated that data to elected members. So I think you can take some reassurance from the fact that we're not alone is um, it's not a signal of our quality, it's a signal of context. And well, sorry, and so one thing that didn't come through in the information, I don't know, was just a clarification around the visitor numbers um, and whether that includes those things like events after hours, you know, um, like community consultations with Waka Katahi, for example, like, how, what, how does the number actually get calculated? Uh, through you, Your Worship, the, the number's calculated from the door counter at, at the facility, so it counts every single person that comes through the door. Um, so if the, regardless if they're coming in for a room booking or an event or to access AA. Thank you. So now the representation community leadership group. Yeah, just a really quick comment, and that is the um, Citizens Panel, which is a new thing, new initiative, and um, 112 expressions. I think, well, that's impressive. A good start. So, well done. So the intention is, is that they get um, involved in the long-term plan amendment submission process and um, we are planning a number of events uh, where they'll be involved. Um, okay, so the regulatory services update. Sorry, that includes, sorry, that includes the consenting information. It yes. does, yes. Uh, page um, 156. Um, obviously, the trend there is um, uh, down on a number of things like building consents, uh, uh, subdivision consents, that kind of thing. So I think we can see that there's a potentially a trend that's being influenced by the um, where the market's at and what's happening in the, in the economy. And so my question really is around how does how do we how are we using this information to um, monitor and track our risks around forecasting assumptions, DCs, um, that kind of thing. So at what point, you know, how do we know at what point uh, these trends mean that we need to change direction or, uh, you know, ponder, not ponder, consider uh, whether we need to um, make some drastic changes or make some adjustments, whether it's financial or um, potentially in terms of our forecasting assumptions as part of the, the long-term plan coming up. Uh, good question. Uh, <laughs> um, Mayor Bernie, um, yeah, that's, look, I guess from a wider market perspective, certainly there's um, a decline in across other councils as well, so I've had some visibility of other numbers. So I think there's a, there appears to be a bit of a national decline, which I talked to, which, you know, looks like a run to the end of the year at least, and then there's, there's um, quite a bit of positivity about a sort of bit of a rebound into, into 24. Um, in terms of DC forecasting, um, we are probably not across that um, at this point um, in my space, so I need to... I'd need to take that offline and have a discussion with um, Jacinta, but in terms of any um, 
tools or other reactions to, to try and turn that around. We probably haven't got to that space just yet. What I will add is that in preparation for the long-term plan proper, we have uh, recently received two projection pieces of work, so one from Sense Partners, one from Infometrics, where they've basically revisited their uh, forward projections. And so we'll, we'll share that information with you. Uh, we'd like to get the long-term plan amendment sort of um, adopted and, and moving forward before we uh, start confusing you about talking about LTP proper. But one of the very first and early pieces of work that you'll do as part of the long-term plan proper will be to look at those forecasting assumptions and start to make those calls and, and see whether or not you, you want to change current settings or not and the information like this will be part of that obviously population is, is one aspect but uh, some of the other information that uh, gives us an indication around lots and houses being built and things uh, will feed into that as well because that triggers some of those other decisions you'll make through that process so um, it's coming basically uh, certainly forefront of our minds at the moment and hopefully there's a budget decision that uh, has probably a considerable impact in terms of uh, the future uh, might be made by then. We might be in a better position to understand you know, what is going to happen. Yeah, and it's, it's probably for me, it's probably a totally like there's obviously a long term piece as part of the long term plan proper, but it's probably taking this information and actually understanding what does it mean for us right now in terms of um, projections, um, particularly the financials. That's, that's, I guess, because if these trends continued into the 23, 24 year, what is the material impact on, um, uh, you know, operating um, costs, you know, um, is it, uh, what's, what's the impact on DCs, what's, so I think there's a flow on effect that would be, and, and I'm not saying it's necessarily today to get that level of detail, but um, that's something I'd be keen to try and use this information to really understand, you know, what does it mean, what's the actual impact if this trend continued. But, yeah, I hope that makes sense. Through you, Roshap, and one thing just to mention is around, so Blair and I have had a lot of conversations recently around activity-based costing and zero based, from a zero-based budgeting in the regulatory space, so that we are getting to a point where we've got a really granular view of time and cost and, and billing and in that space so that it's we can understand what the levers look like in terms of resourcing versus revenue. So Blair's been doing a lot of work in that space, and our, we, our team will be supporting him through that. Yep. Community support. Um, Kessel took a Mere's task force for jobs. Need all right. Like, um, so <laughs> the, before even reading this, someone in the public said to me, Oh, I saw the mayor on TV and he had this young guy and they were at the granite place and that it was a really good story. So, and then I read it and I'm like, Oh, yeah, yeah. They knew that before because I didn't see it on TV. Um, and then my question, I just got a couple, is bottom of page 160. Has that um, planning for Nangatanga session for March happened yet? It, did, it had March but not a date. And is that, or oh, I've missed the boat. Or... Uh, through you, Your Worship, I, I need, I'd need to check that. And come back to you, Councillor Tukapur, but I can I can turn that around pretty quickly and um, come back to you. That's it. And I'm just going to take this opportunity to highlight for the table, page uh, 162, that table, where there's um, our, all our networks and your um, clints for the education. I do youth and same with uh, Ellen there. And these are some of our key priorities at the moment. And I just want to say... Um, bear that in mind <laughs> when we're, you know, making decisions a little bit later. Thank you. Um, just to highlight me, task with jobs and uh, the work that Tammy and Julie are doing in that space, we are leading the country in terms of, um, of um, uh, allocate, well, job um, numbers. Um, Mears task with jobs has now created 1,000 positions across the country in the space um, or less than three years, um, which is an incredible achievement and just shows um, the impact that councils can have on their local communities where, um, you know, we're making a huge difference in terms of uh, that. So it's not only about the pipes and the drains, but it's actually um, 
of thing. Um, and I'm happy to take all the kudos in the world for um, all their good work, um, Brent. But you know, I know that they they are doing a fantastic job in that space and getting uh, nationally recognised for it as well, which is fantastic. Yes. Um, so can I just say furthermore? Yes, you know, Tammy and Julia are doing a great job. And, you know, you mentioned the national stats, but in there it's like over 60 in a period of like six months, really. So they've like placed um, young people in jobs like 10 a month. That's a really good result compared to what is MSD doing. Um, we're doing fabulous. <laughs> so thank you. But they've got the passion, they care, the genuine, because I've met with them, and they are. Um, yeah, they're proactive. That's the difference. I think they're just doing a great job. Um, and I'm sure at some stage we will get a, you know, have them appearing before council to give a full report in terms of um, that would be really, really good. Yeah. Just in the community support space, just do want to draw attention to page 35 or 165 of your agenda. So destination management space. It's something we're Quite very proud of just the way that uh, that campaign, the rebrand is is going. Um, so some really positive signs there in terms of the traction that that's that's getting. Also, want to thank the elected members who helped out at Rural Games over the, the weekend. Again, we had a lot of interactions there, and we'll, that will see a lot of traffic um, driven to that site. And we have, um, whilst this is looking back, just a heads up that. We have uh, just started another Wellington-based campaign, so um, a lot of bus back advertising, a couple of the big um, digital billboards in the city there and things, so we're going to eagerly watch that space just to see what the, the uptake and uh, further reach that that provides as well. And just adding to that, um, the success of the pre of our presence at the Rural Games is not to be underestimated at all, that we had over 800 people through our site at the Royal Games, which was a, um, and thank you to Count the, Dave, the Deputy Mayor and others who uh, visited that site. Uh, but um, it showed Horrifano in a great light, and as David said, the new logos and, and the feel about it are creating some really good um, vibes, and um, it was great to see um, the staff um, interact with those people that were there as well. It was cool. Yeah. Um, we then move to community infrastructure. Councillor Tuggle. Uh, I've been very positive, but now it's did uh, 175. <laughs> um, top 175, Waitari Beach surf life saving um, risk around, you know, didn't get that far. You know, basically, I add up a shortfall of now a million dollars. You add the 750 and the 250, yeah. So, I um, it's, it's well underway. So, so what are we going to do about it? Um, what else can we do other than and is this the shortfall now going to appear or need to appear in our LTPA? The timing because I know construction is we're in the middle of it and it. It's meant to be opening, was it October this year? Or, no, sorry. Well, yeah. Do, yeah. do we, like, how, how, you got a plan of attack? Yeah, through you, Your Worship. I was hoping to highlight that um, as a key risk that we are working quite closely with Eastern Central Community Trust. Uh, still hopeful that that um, funding application of 250k will, will come through. Uh, the prospect around lotteries, certainly the landscape has changed um, since when that uh, assumption was made and commitment to, the, to fund the project. So the resolution of council at the time was to build the project and make an assumption that that funding would come through. Um, it, you know, it is possible that we come back with some options and we already have making, been making some inquiries about where there could be scope for, for staging that contract, but it is you know, certainly challenged given that we have a made a full commitment to construction. So we'll come back with a separate update around that um, you know, once we get feedback from Eastern Central and, and particularly around the impact on um, how that would be funded through LTP. And, oh, sorry. Just if I can add to that, um, we do have uh, current applications in with ECCT and with lotteries. So the feedback we got from lotteries, um, we've incorporated and re 
reworked the application form and that has been submitted. Um, so we'd expect to hear back in the next couple of months regarding the result um, around that. Um, they have flagged that potential. There is some risk with obviously Cyclone Gabriel and funds being um, allocated elsewhere, but um, we just wanted to make it clear that we have got an application and two applications that are live right now. Mayor Bernie and I are also meeting with Eastern and Central Community Trust on Monday, so this is one of the matters that are on our agenda to discuss with them. Because while we understand and acknowledge that Cyclone Gabriel has an impact, doesn't change the allocation rules within their constitution, which should, should ensure Horofanoa gets its um, right slice of the pie. Um, also, I don't think uh, we could go past this um, community infrastructure report without mentioning the green flags and congratulations Arthur and your team um, for the continued great work that you do in that space. Um, it's really fantastic. It's certainly been, um, you know, puts Horofana on the map big time in terms of uh, that sort of thing. And also, um, and it has been acknowledged before, but um, our contractors, uh, recreational services, and the way they uh, presented the domain for the two rugby games that we had here, plus the Chapel Cup uh, that they uh, managed to uh, ensure happened, um, have been a huge credit to this district. And um, it's, um, you know, I know I've spoken personally with the team, um, but they uh, deserve to be recognised for the work that they have done in that space. Okay, moving on to land transport. Uh, I, I do think Brent might just have one quick update that will save him an email. Okay. Yes, um, we are going out with an expression of interest for Live In Courthouse for a um, cafe-style eatery. We've had an approach from um, the community, so we're testing the market um, by the end of the week. Um, obviously, there's some logistical things that we're working through with, with um, the Alliance and working with Daniel uh, around that. Um, but just wanted to, to let you guys know that, that you'll see that coming out um, very shortly. Cool. Can, can I just ask a question about that particular topic? It's been raised. Yeah. yeah um, so, because one of the things that um, it seems was a problem with the previous time that we went out with the expression of interest is that there'd been no indication from council potentially around a willingness to perhaps put forward some capital uh, investment into making that site fit for purpose for the type of tenant that we want to attract. Are, are we are we signalling anything around our uh, openness to have those conversations around what they need in terms of fit out and that kind of thing? Uh, through you, Your Worship, probably, it's probably not as um, specific as that, but the language we're using is working together to transform that space into a um, vibrant community asset. Um, so we can be more prescriptive if we if we desire, um, but we are a bit more pointed at the moment with what we're looking for. Thanks, Brent. Look forward to that. Um, okay, land transport. Kelsey, talk about. Uh, page one seventy seven and topic why Tadere rise. So this development was before my time. Um, and it reads that we are doing, you know, working on flood mitigation and trying to find also short-term solutions prior to winter. Um, was that our development or someone else's and we're cleaning up the after effect? Or... That's really your worship. Uh... No, it's not. I mean, it's not our development. It's a, um, it was a private development, and we are assisting, I guess, as um, you know, standing up in the community and trying to assist those out there who are struggling. Um, so there are some aspects that we're working on, and we, you know, we are trying to get to a, to a positive outcome before winter. We're pretty close. We've got some plans, um, pretty low cost. There's been a bit of contention out there and a bit of noise, um, but I think we've. Um, Damp, damp in most
much that down now and we've actually got the developer back to the table who's going to contribute to a significant extent anyway. We may offer to do some works um, just to, to play our part, um, but yeah, rather than it blow up and, and become a bigger issue, I think there's a, there's a pretty reasonable short-term um, fix there and then there's some, potentially some longer-term work to do as well, but um, but we're very close with we've basically got a couple of meetings this week to take that back out um, to the Wadawiri community and um, and have some discussions. So, so everyone's pretty much on board. Um, it is a it was a pretty messy space, but it's now quite a positive collaborative space. So, Councillor Tommy Hun. Um, kia ora, thanks for that, guys. I suppose just following on from Councillor Took because I'm interested in what those short term and long term um, solutions look like. Um, and I've had it very clearly articulated to me by lots of people that uh, the forest um, cannot be um, the receiver. Just so really clear. Kia At this point, the forest not, is not intended to be the receiver, and I think uh, we went through those um, plans. Really, it's about at the stage just trying to um, manage some of the overland flow paths. Um, away from people's properties um, and in some in some storage um, within the reserve space. And from that point, we'll look at where to from there um, should the issue continue. Um, I suppose my only point really to reconsider is that um, Council would have been well aware of risks eliminated through submission processes. And I suppose what I'm saying is I find it really hard to where that council have to um, repair a developer's um, issue. Um, but however, I said we're in a predicament. Um, but again, I say due diligence for me would have been, um, you know, in going into the future, it's about actually ensuring that where we're developing can actually be developed. And I suppose that's really my message to, to us all. Certainly a conversation that's happening right around the country. Uh, Councillor Jennings. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Just on page 50, under the heading Issues of Risk, Road and Roadside Flooding. In a previous council term, um, I think we were given some advice that one of the things we have with our roading supplier partner was that when there is uh, forecasted heavy rain events, that there's like a schedule or a appendix to the contract or something along the lines that has a number of sites that are to be proactively cleared and attended to in terms of drain drains and that kind of thing. And I just wondered whether we've updated that and, and whether that's sort of reflected, you know, some of that intel from from some of the events we had in the last year and, and before. Because if, if they haven't, it would be good to be able to do that so that we can communicate kind of the actions that council takes on a proactive basis to the community in those in those sites. Yeah, through you, Your Worship. Um, we certainly are, and you'll probably see from some of the updates that there's been a focus on addressing some of those longer standing issues. Uh, we're getting to that point where that is being delivered through our roading team currently. There's not a dedicated resource for that. Through LTPA, we look at you know um, contemplating further investment in that area that would actually allow a dedicated resource in a, in a longer term program. So certainly looking at those reactive issues and working with the contractor, but we're also looking to, to the longer term as well and uh, starting to try and address some of those issues so that they're not reoccurring. Um, also, um, I don't want to um, pass this report without acknowledging the Gladstone uh, Road realignment. It's great to see that that is finally uh, completed and I'm sure the roading team are uh, more than happy to get on with some other work other than that, which has probably occupied their minds for um, some years. Uh, but also acknowledging um, the work of the contractors that um, did that work. Um, they did a fantastic job. And I know the community out there are extremely grateful for the amount of investment that we've made over there. Okay, solid waste. Wastewater treatment. Councillor Tugapur. Uh, page 186. 
Two Matters, the first one, Shannon Wastewater Treatment Plant. And, well, yes, I knew that um, the irrig irrigation block was managed by a different party. Um, but the fact that maintenance hasn't been carried out for some time and now we're having to rectify it and then obviously now transfer it to the Alliance as part of their contract. Like, what happened there? Who, did we drop the ball or what? I kind of... So, so it's a new three year worship. It's a it's a new system up and running. So it's that um, effectively there's not a lot of routine maintenance required when you've got a brand new um, set of irrigation systems and um, pipe networks that get moved around and sprinklers. But over time through use, we do need to get that regular maintenance up and running. So it's been identified that the best party to do that is through the alliance. Um, so there's certainly a, a refocus back on. Shannon Wastewater to ensure that we've A, got our maintenance up and running, but also uh, getting back around the table with Nati Whakateri around some of the longer term objectives um, around that project, around the high level flow passes. So we've, we've got some who we set up in coming weeks around that aspect as well. So we're certainly getting a lot of attention. We'll be out there walking the, the land at, um, at Shannon Wastewater along with a number of our other plants in, over the coming weeks to get, to get ready for that winter period. And the um, other matter on that page, Tokomaru Wastewater. Now, I acknowledge it says um, further down that um, we'll be presented this in the third quarter. What I have a uh, bit of an issue with is, um, and I know you're working with, you know, groups, um, like a working party type thing, but that number two where there's um, your optioneering and co costing out the possibility of Tokomaru waste being pumped through a new pipeline to Palmerston North when we know Palmerston North and their um, wastewater astronomical uh, catastrophe. <laughs> anyway, you get my point. It's, um, it's not just the connecting to them because... Uh, they presented to us a whole raft of options for them, and one of them was piping into us coming the other way. And I, and I mean, obviously, it didn't land there, but for obvious uh, cost reasons. Um, and and I, what also bothers me is when we did the same exercise for. The drinking water supply tapping into uh, what well, the option was a three million dollar option for Tokomaru, and then we have this brilliant um, infrastructure manager Gallo was his name. He's like, "Oh no, I can fix that at ten percent of the price." We paid three hundred thousand compared to the three million we were quoted, and I just think. It's a it's a great system. It works. It's effective, and you know the stark difference. And I just I I don't want to really entertain something too much. Like how much work you had to do on that, and then we just kick it down the road anyway because it's beyond our reach. I because like that WSP consultant. So that, that that name's only come up once throughout, and um. I think they used to be Opus, I don't know. But then in the finance report, already, unless they're doing other projects with us that I'm not aware of, we're already paid over $600,000 within one financial year so far. And is it because of this uh, and that work? So it's, I'm coming from all angles, but that's where my thinking's at. Yeah, through you, Your Worship, I'll start with the final question around that payment, a, a large proportion of that work has been tied up with the Wakate um, revocation business case that was undertaken uh, in the early part of this financial year and then specific advice uh, to inform the O2NL um, you know, expert hearing. So that's fully cost recovered, so we probably need to report back around the level of uh, recovery for that um, at some point to, to give some comfort. Uh, the um, Moving backwards from there, the plan 
whilst we, we've launched the consent, so we can carry on operating that plant um, whilst we move through uh, the next stage of our preparations for consenting. Uh, we, we do have further work to do with our iwi partners and particularly signal through the consent um, from Rangitane that we've got some further um, investigation and, and work to do alongside them. So that, that process will happen in parallel with us bringing back to council a paper that really sets out the long list of projects that were were put forward in the consent to a point where in time we'll be requesting um, you know, delegation for a effective an $8 million investment in a new treatment plant in land irrigation system, which has been on the table for some time. The reason we're just doing that further investigation to ensure we can close the door on those alternatives <laughs> is that this decision will be required to go through the NTU as a strategic um, decision and they'll certainly ask the question around that consolidation. So the current territorial boundaries that we you know, have, Otafana District versus Pumas and all, won't necessarily sit the same when they start looking more holistic at an entity level. So we're doing that thinking in advance, um, almost to prove that if the $8 million solution for Tokamaru um, stacks up against a 10 or a 12, then we've done a little bit of due diligence uh, to bring that table, uh, firstly to NTU, but also around the council table. So certainly not um, going down a road, but the, the concepts are already there for uh, the Palmas North connection. We've looked historically at about three different routes. It's just a matter of putting some uh, updated figures, estimates, basically, to say this would be the cost and these would be the risks and the challenges. And we know some of those are, are related to the Palmas North current system itself. So we'd, we'd clearly highlight those when we, when we bring that um, to council in a, in a paper. I guess I just want to flag for that group, because ultimately we'll come back to council, but, um, you know, they'll have a preferred option, and I'm just signalling, well, number two, from a, an experience costing perspective on based on other projects I've while I've been here, yeah, that's not looking favourable at this stage. Thanks. Three okay, you, you wish it, it may be worth discussing the water because it has been highlighted in the in the water section on page one ninety three around the risk of the Tokamaru solution. So at the time, it was um, you know deemed as an effective remedy for a a pretty significant issue. Uh, time certainly moved on in terms of drinking water standards and the requirements and thresholds that we need to meet for a um, for a drinking water supply. One of the challenges is around the, the, we call it the muddiness or the turbidity of the water, that that plant is set up to manage what's called two NTU, but when we get a big storm event, it effectively hits 100. So we're regularly uh, going through a process to truck water from Levin or Shannon to the Tokamoto site as soon as we get a a spark of rainfall so I will be looking to put together the, the team's busy working in the background around the cost benefit of a plant replacement um, so full upgrade for a membrane treatment plant uh, that would treat that water to the highest standard and we'd be bringing the numbers around what it's currently costing us to operate the plant and also um, truck that water from out of town and and the other factor of that is that that we've had notification around the likely fluoridation requirements so that particular plant wouldn't be well set up so there'd be a significant cost um, to retrofit for fluoridation so the combination of those two that we may be able to share that cost um, across fluoridation and a plant upgrade and would bring those numbers back so it certainly at the time was a was a great solution but things have moved on and it, it is proving quite challenging um, for, for operation currently to meet required drinking water standards it's our our highest risk plant, and so when it hits a certain level, we just have to shut it down and truck water in for the supply, which is not ideal. That that fluoridation, though, the directive is for living at this stage, and um, they haven't said which ones will roll out next. In which case, could be two, and realising it two years from now, which might not be our problem or work to. It's a tricky. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, let's move on. Um, we are up to strong water. Uh, 
Um, okay, water. We've just talked about. Yeah. Mr. Mayor. Councillor Jen. Sorry, you just had a series of questions around the water. Um, so page 194 under the fluoridation heading. So I just got sort of four questions. Um, can you just remind me around the revised procurement plan and what, what that was about? Second, the reference there is to commencing the work in December 2023, but from memory, the direction required it to be in place by July 2023. So if you could talk to that. Um, the other question I had was, yeah, around, just can you remind me in terms of the long-term plan amendment, whether we actually have got any provision, like contingency provision for sites other than Levin that might be mandated? And then the fourth question was something that's come through just from the community, which was a question around, will there be a supply available at the treatment plant that's not fluoridated, um, that like, like a tap or something that people can access? So sorry if you, if you want me to repeat any of those. So so yes, for the last one, we, we have discussed that during our site visits, um, that that type of initiative could be accommodated um, at appropriate locations. Uh, Stepping backwards from that, the, the revised. So I'll, I'll, do, I'll address the other one around the contingency fund that we haven't in the LTPA put a contingency fund around the other sites. Uh, the assumption was that those would be installed post 1 July 24, so the planning work would happen prior, but the physical works and funding of which um, through the through the um, three waters transition process. The other thing that we have initiated through, you know, because we've had early signals around those other sites um, that we will be given directive around those. And so what we were looking to do through the revised procurement plan is to actually go out to the market, um, so through a competitive process, to lock in the Levin solution and actually go and relock it, um, appropriate treatment, be it powder um, or, or liquid, but also get a separable portion price for the remaining sites. So then we can go back to the ministry with certainty that these are the costs for the other plants so that we don't get out of sync or carry risk around the funding allowance for those. So there's a lot of dialogue and backwards and forwards currently happening with the ministry over the, over the last two months to firstly address the issue around the live-in site and a request for extension. And so the engineers have reviewed our process, our procurement approach, and they're much more comfortable um, than where we sat with the original proposal that we didn't have a finite estimate because it was, you know, it was we worked with one supplier. There was a ballpark figure. We actually hadn't locked that in through a competitive process. So we're working through that. They're very supportive. We signalled that the work could be completed by December this year. They've come back with feedback around current market constraints with supply, and they've suggested that's actually pushed out to April uh, 2024. So that was that the suggestion of the um, engineers employed by the ministry. We're, as of today, yet to get the final sign-off on the extension and approval of costs. So at the moment, the Ministry haven't provided funding. Uh, there is a directive, uh, you could probably say, we are uh, managing that compliance risk um, as, as best we can with, with the Ministry contacts. Thanks, Daniel. Um, okay, the growth report. Just uh, definitely to two. Page 201 in the agenda, page 71, the um, overview table for the Housing Action Plan. Um, really like this document, the way it's pulled together about what will happen and who will lead and who will support in, in the process. Um, very, very embryonic at this stage, I get that, but two comments. One is, um, would it be fair to ask that the updates become sharper over, over time, the more measurable, first question, and the second one, am I right in thinking that this document will be part of the workshop we're going to have around the whole, you know, Blair's presentation, that this will be part of the workshop? Yeah, through you, Your Worship. Um, definitely, I think... Um, like you say, it's very embryonic in its, um, <laughs> in its um, maturity at this point, and that's um, an initial uh, indication of direction. I think, like we've talked about, or some, I've talked to somebody about um, 
document came from sort of 2019 and a lot's changed since pre-COVID times, um, you know, in a, in a lot of fronts and a lot of spaces. So, so there's still a bit of work to do there in terms of, I guess, um, to your point, considering what is uh, still valid and what that looks like from a measurable perspective and then how do we translate that into um, a more um, precise view for you ongoing. So I think following this report, there was an intent to continue to develop our space. So my space in particular is quite new, um, but as we travel, then we'll have more and more uh, metrics into that space, um, both across the consenting side, which contributes to that, um, but also um, on that side from a market perspective. So next week we'll go through some of those opportunities to give you more vi more visibility, but like I've said too, there's quite a bit of, um, you know, uh, quite um, sensitive in their nature around um, timing and, and and what's happening and um, who's in the know when. So uh, we don't control all those processes, so we're sort of travelling a bit of a fine line as to, as to what we can share, but hopefully next week you'll get a much clearer view as to the direction of travel anyway. Capital Projects Overview. Yes, Jeff. Sorry, I'm going to do paint. Um, I'm really pleased to see um, Hose Road Reservoir in green there, and obviously I understand that that's go going tracking well. Um, the questions I had were just around the Lake Horofenua water quality improvements and the Queen Street stormwater consent, and it's probably a request more than a question, which is, I was just there's obviously there's quite a bit of discussion and interest in this in the community, and I think we've got in my calculations we have about 7.3 million that was allocated between 2021 and 2026 uh, for those two projects or two, two sort of um, subjects. And I just wonder if we could do a little workshop or public workshop shop to sort of explain where we're at in terms of the uh, concepts or what we're actually looking at in terms of the design of those things and what's actually going to take place because I think it's an opportunity for us to demonstrate that there is a lot of work going on there and that um, there are some concepts um, that, that are going to be deployed or are being worked up, obviously, or all the complexity of, of rolling those things out as well. Certainly timing thing once those workshops have been undertaken um, with you know, Link Domain, we have partners around that. Um, we could look to program in a, a workshop um, with our community as well. Um, certainly in time we could look at that, yeah. So it's very much a matter of gathering up data, a lot of the moving pieces around the lake, um, even as far as getting land ownership patterns, looking at what's happening with other photo wetlands, the connections for the number of streams um, development that could be happening in the, in the north of the bin. So trying to get all that down, uh, working closely with um, some representatives around MTA and the work they're doing around the Freshwater Improvement Fund as well, So and, and fish monitoring. So there's a whole lot of moving pieces around the lake and we've mobilised the team to, to start pulling all that together um, only only in recent months. So that's, yeah, it's still, still a work in progress. Because I guess a follow-up to that is I imagine that at this stage the plan spend through the long-term plan against actual spend is probably, there's probably quite a big gap there. And so one of the things that we'll need to start turning our mind to is what does... Um, any underspend what or any further investment, what does that look like in terms of that further long term planning process? Because we're obviously coming into that window. Um, but you'll be able to present some numbers around, um, you know, planned spend versus actual spend just to get a sense of where we're, where we're at. Yeah, we're look, looking to quite a deep dive at the initial um, steering group on 29th of March, project by project. Uh, out of that, we'll be seeking direction on. Awesome, almost some exceptions reporting, be that around financial variance or, or timing, um, if it's shifting over financial years. So that would be something that we could then filter back into perhaps some dashboard reporting around OPR and the like. So it's, yeah, we're look, looking for sort of direction at that initial steering group. Just, yeah. if I may, um, follow on that, topic, um, suggest perhaps um, to get some more traction um, is if we uh, governance could meet with 
the lack trustees, their whole, their governance, you know, governance to governance, and um, understand their aspirations, you know, firsthand, face to face, and um, at least that be a step we can take and then get something on the ground going, because, yeah. Anyway, just a suggestion. Worthy, yes, I'm going to follow that up actually. That, look, for me, I think when we think about going into a long term plan amendment that we're doing, is from uh, my perspective, the biggest risk that we're going to get from the community is that we've got an elephant in the room that's no, not, not named in a long term plan amendment. That um, I, yeah, I, I think that you know, all parties and the community and Dewe and the landholders of trust, there needs to be some form of, of traction because it's, it's got a feeling like it's, well, once we deal with the landfill, we, we'll replace it with the lake. Um, and I think the community um, wants us to be seen and, and wants to know what the eighty thousand dollars for the development, um, Lake Punahou um, project is, and this sort of stuff, so that they've got something tangible to see that there is action, there is some form of movement. Um, thanks, Clint. I I just um, others might have a different view, but um, I guess as a first step, I suggested that group because they represent the original owners and the those who have succeeded uh, to that ownership of the lake. So, that, you know, when we talk about um, let's rezone this and that, and, you know, let's approach the, the landowners first. So in this instance, let's talk to the owners, the lake trustees first, and then go wider and wider. Yeah. Council probably uh, we do have a lake court. Maybe we can reinvigorate that and re-initiate the leadership of that again. Yeah. And there is some work going on in behind the scenes to establish the, um, you know, the status of um, both, uh, especially the lake court um, and the what do we call it the the other one that was chaired by Kevin O'Connor. The domain board. The domain board. That's right. Yeah. Okay, let's move on then. Um, any further questions around the financial report? Yes, just two um, two things. The first one is um, so the outstanding debts um, by debtor type, and um, actually it was Councillor Jennings that. That triggered this um, that water by meters that is of 17 percent and if you go on to page 218 there's a breakdown and I, I note that Levin and is it, I think it says Fidikino water by meter debtors um, Le, Le, Levin's got you know three months outstanding of you know, 200,000 and then you at the next 30, 60 days, and it equates to 320,000. So uh, uh, my first question around that is, is that made up of a single or multiple users? And what's the kind of timing looking like for recovery if already that's three months over? Um, because if... You know, we don't have water meters district wide yet, and that's the. Yeah, I guess I just want to know are we. Is, how will we track in, or in your that views? Through your, your worship. So, in this space, there's been, I guess, first the focus has been on the rate stators um, to get that ironed out, working well, process driven in terms of. There was a bit of a history of being kind by not following up and, and making things legal when people weren't paying. Um, but actually, that view in terms of 
going forward is that that's actually not ending up being kind because people end up a long way behind. So what we've been doing is getting that really clear, regularly following up. That's seen a 20% reduction in rate status, so there's, that's going extremely well. In the water space, actively at the moment, there's a very um, there's a big piece of work happening to clean up that space, truly understand what's going on with the meters that are overdue. In quite a number of cases, there will have been leaks that have been, have been um, challenged and not dealt with. So what we are doing is dealing with them. Um, I'm not going to sugarcoat the fact that the way that this has been managed in the past in terms of collection in this water space wouldn't wouldn't score a gold star. Um, but we're working towards making sure that that is really well done. Um, and so we've got some extra resource focused in that space at the moment to make sure that it's really clear where there has been a challenge between whether people should be paying or not, whether they've got a leak and they fixed it, making sure that that's all wrapped up. And then what we can do is make sure that we then move that on to debt collection if there isn't payment that's made and follow exactly the same process as happens for the rest of rates. So at the moment, it's not as well oiled as is the rate side of things, but it's it's on the way. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta get the handle on it. Um, cool. Uh, the last query is on page 221 um, and the um, again this is a councillor Jennings um, it, it makes me reflect on and this is number 19 around um, sort of the legal advice uh, that clearly we need from time to time but there's also litigation that um, occurs and we don't always know about it till the till it's getting ugly and um and i just because we didn't have the sort of you um council jennings had raised having a bit more oversight and some of that and i, I just wondered might might we revisit that or is there another avenue to monitor and or do we accept that you know uh, we spend that amount or more on an annual basis. Through you, Worship, one thing, so going forward, this you, you won't see this in part of this, this report. It will be part of the Rating and Funding Task Force, where we'll be able to go into a bit more detail in terms of who we're spending money with, probably as well expand the listings and, and as we work through the procurement side of things as well, um, with with Nikki coming on board soon and the two of them working together is starting to take a look at our full supplier database as well, understand exactly who we're spending money with over a period of time and start to build up that sort of, when we talk about legal spend, for example, that category spend and understand what we're doing in those particular spaces. And when I say understand, I mean having good conversations with you so that there's transparency around that and we can make decisions and understand how we might want to change what we're doing going forward. Um, if I could just make two comments. One is to obviously acknowledge that like, if, the, if we were um, ever going down the route of you know, legal action other than general kind of legal advice, the Chair of Risk and Assurance would be one of the first elected members to know other than the mayor and we of course would make sure that that is brought to the table particularly if direction is needed on you know if there's two options what way we might go um just following on from Jacinta's commentary I think that um part of our um context is particularly with um O2 and L um the in the the, the legal costs can be a little bit swayed at the moment and so I think that providing the opportunity to split out well, what is going towards that project versus some versus general council BAU stuff but with um, Mrs Brady joining the team you know that whole idea of preferred suppliers a supply panel being really clear about who we're spending the money and that we've deliberately chosen that, that is who our preferred supplier is for legal um, for legal costs, that's a really important process that we need to do. Just like we've got to do it for a few other things, but um, legal costs in particular would be a high priority of ours that we would 
we would give a review to because we have so many legal service providers and um, so that's not giving you a clear view on how much we're spending on legal costs full stop. That just happens to be at that particular point in time um, a particular law firm that happens to be in the top 20 creditors. That's the problem. Uh, yeah, I just maybe it's a bit late at night, but um, I'm trying to understand the pie chart on page 217, why we have so many development contributions unpaid, and then reconciling that with the table on statement of sundry debtors. And we've got a large portion in our not yet adopted uh, LTP or amendment about development contributions. So through you, Your Worship, um, in, the, in the DC space, so we've had a look at that, um, and basically it's around the trigger points for payment of those. Um, so well, this trick, there's about three or four different trigger points around um, CCC, building consent stage, land use consent stage. So all of those, um, in terms of the information I'll be provided, are still active, so they're still outstanding but not overdue. So when they get to finishing their build, then it'll go out potentially with the CCC, at the CCC stage, um, and they won't get the CCC until they've paid. So, so I've sort of driven around trigger points, which incentivise the payment. Um, it's probably come from the past, I think, from past DC policy, so it could be reviewed, um, could be reconsidered. Yeah, I was hoping that they, maybe we do need to get a bit tougher on development contributions, so it's not left to the very last minute and there's arguments between developers and purchases of houses and things like that. Through your worship, we do take, typically will wait till the end of the process, so till they apply for the 224C or the CCC to invoice. So I think in this case, they've been invoiced a little bit earlier than they needed to be as part of their, their process so that they're looking like they're overdue and they're not quite. Yeah. Can I speak on that one? Given our policy says that we need payment before any building works undertaken on site, 3.85 um that kind of doesn't seem to align with the answers you guys are providing them are we kind of complying with the policy we've got and preventing them from undertaking any activity on site on any properties that we're developing until they're paying these contributions for three months outstanding and almost half a million dollars through your worship i think look there's look there probably is um some room for discussion there, I guess, because there, there is um, there are some policies around um, payment timings that you know, we're looking at. Um, I've had some discussions with Jacinta about already um, in our building space. I mean, part of one of the struggles we've had this year around um, performance in our financial space is that uh, a lot of the payments were up front in the housing boom. A lot of the payments were up front in the housing boom, so we collected a lot of the revenue last financial year, and we, we collected a lot of the costs this financial year. So our team and my space has, has been pretty uh, pretty um, hit pretty hard this year um, so yeah we're, we're certainly considering all of those um, payments and timings and, and locations of those payments because yeah it has has created some issues that you all see in the accounts this, uh, at this point but there's no you know certainly no intention to carry on in that space I'll just note I mean finishing it's an active conversation in the team. <laughs> Have we got this right? Are all the ones, typically you, the, a big chunk of them are going to be subdivision ones where you're not going to invoice them until you get to the 224 stage. Um, so from that perspective, I think they're billed a little bit too early. There may, but we're actively, there were a couple initially that were um, where the, the CCC was passed over um, and payment plans were s subsequently set up to collect. But it's in this space, it's something we're actively looking at and making sure we've got it right. Yeah. Okay. So, Ms. Smith, can I just close? Can I just close the loop on the discussion that Councillor Tukabu had around the legal things? Just a question arose. So, am I and understand you correct, Monique, that um, we can expect some breakdown around legal spend either in the OPR report as a separate document sometime soon that, that gives us some visibility around that legal spend as a as a as a start of a sort of more monitoring or reporting around suppliers. Is that is that correct? Um, so commitment is we've got to do that work internally first um, and set up a process in which we can review our suppliers. But yeah, at the right time absolutely 
um, bring that to council, probably not on the OPR and a public agenda. Okay, and, and then sorry, the other question that uh, Council took about sort of raised, the other portion of that is we had, I don't know if we've agreed, obviously uh, beyond the no surprises updates from you, uh, were we going to have a litigation report either as part of normal Council report or risk and assurance? I think we discussed that at some point some time ago. Yeah, I th so I think the intent was to establish like a quarterly um, file update to council um, and it, it's just one of those things we haven't quite got to yet in terms of on the improvement register. Okay, um, now on to the risk report. And then the Statement of Service Performance, the SSPs. So, Mr. Mayor, I've got a series of these, but would you prefer to take them offline? Okay. I think that would be appropriate at the time that, yeah, uh, um, where there's more, you know, opportunity to uh, talk about those. Um, is there any other forum that we have these come to the... There's nothing. Okay. So just, yeah, get them in and we'll do it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that's the end of uh, the organisational performance report. That probably took a little bit longer than we had thought, but I think an extremely useful uh, conversation and really appreciate the fact the five of you are lined up like that where you can interact and give those responses like you have done. Um, and no doubt, look, this will evolve over over time. Um, and um, I know it's difficult for us not to delve too much into the weeds of things, but really appreciate the feedback that we've got. And the body of the report, obviously, is um, fantastic. So it's great that we can tell our community the good and the bad at the same time. Thank you. So, um, look, I'm conscious of the time and the fact that there's a meal out the back uh, for us, but as long as that's not getting too cold, um, Joni, I'd like to kick on and at least finish, try and finish the body of the agenda before we have a break for the in-committee part of it. Um, so I'm not trying to hurry you up by any means, um, just that, um, um, yeah. So we're moving to 8.2, the long-term plan 2021-2041 monitoring report. Uh, I'll move 2.1, 2.2, the amount of being received and recognised as not significant. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Allen, seconded by Councillor Horry Parr. All those in favour? Against? Carried. Are there any items um, that councillors wish to seek clarity on? Deputy Mayor Allen. Uh, yeah. To Mr. Mayor, aware of the time, um, looking at page 262, the Foxton Beach Stormwater Discharge Quality Monitoring and the Resource Consent, um, now that the team's been set up, can we expect some traction on this? I know the, you know the horizon side of it is a bit out of our control, but it is very much an ongoing issue, and we heard from Brett Russell earlier about how front of mind that is too for, for Foxton Beach. So... Is the hope with Craig on the case that we can get some traction on this, I guess is the question. <coughs> Foxton Beach Stormwater? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Foxton East Drainage. Yeah, yeah. Fo uh, Foxton East Drainage. No, sorry. It's, yeah, I, topic number two, page 262. You see, yeah, Foxton, Foxton Beach Stormwater consent. Yeah, uh, so... There was a lot of work in the back end of last year, particularly with Rangitane, around um, you know, that looming consent. And we're engaging in the first part of this year with um, MTA and Ngāti Raukawa around moving forward with that. Um, so there's certainly a lot happening. The, um, the technical, so in, in parallel with that, there's a whole technical assessment, um, which is called the Section 92 which is the work that Horizon did, are doing to effectively return fire. So it's a, a two-pronged process where um, 
we're ensuring we're lining up with our EWI partners whilst that technical work is undertaken uh, by Horizon. So you can expect an update um, shortly on that as, as that work develops. Thank, thank you. Uh, second item is the Fox in each drainage scheme. And I just want to highlight this around the table, the significance of this issue for the people of Foxton, the eastern side of, of Highway 1 and Foxton in particular. And it's really important that we keep um, Horizon's feet to the fire over this. We need to acknowledge that they are facing a genuine dilemma in terms of the cost blowout for the options. Acknowledge that. Acknowledge also that, the, that there's been some very good real-time, real-work advocacy by our two Horizons councillors, Councillor Ferguson and Councillor Clark. But the fact remains that the solution that Horizons is adopting at the moment is not a solution at all. In the event of the when, not the if, in the event of a significant flood, 80, somewhere north of 80 homes are at risk um, in that community north of the north of the highway, and so it's 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 important that we both at, at officer level but also as elected members continue to highlight that the current solution that they're adopting, pending some some application for further funding, is simply not good enough, and we need to be future proofing uh, the needs of that community. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any further monitoring report items? Can, uh, can no, I, just wanted, I just wanted to endorse what Deputy Mayor Allen has raised on the two points. Kia ora. Okay. Kia ora. Maybe they can come to the Projects Committee. Yeah. Okay, um, moving to 8.3, the uh, Regional Committee Activity Update. Uh, move 2.1, report be received and recognised as not significant. Uh, moved by Deputy Mayor Allen, seconded by Councillor Tokopo. All those in favour? Against? Carried? Any comments or questions that members have? Just another example of making sure that everybody is aware of what happens in those committees. I know in the past we have tended, while well, they've been available, they haven't been tended to be included in um, agenda, uh, agendas. So good to see. And I know that these, are, uh, you know, sort of some time ago now, December and um, September of last year, but the next uh, committee meeting will have the uh, minutes from the meetings that we just held at the beginning of March. Okay, moving to the Council Resolution and Actions Monitoring Report, March 2023. Um, move 2.1, 2.2, 2 .2, the report be received and the matter recognised as not significant. Again, uh, Councillor Allen moving, seconded by Councillor Tukapu. All those in favour? against carried. Any items on that monitoring report that councillors seek clarity on? Councillor Tukapua. Item reference 22 forward slash 166 page 283. Massive hold up on that um, cafe. Uh, yeah, in Fox and it, like it's literally been a year now. Like April 11th and it's March, April next month, so, like, do you know more? Like, what's going on? I know, I share your frustration. Um, so all, all I can report is that um, I'm confident that officers have done all we can uh, to present a lease <clears throat> that uh, we think is appropriate. Um, I note that the comment talks about how the Windmill Trust has confirmed it wants to meet with senior officers around the broader tourism development plan for Te Aoha Foxton and just confirming that um, senior officers, um, including two GMs and myself, have have, um, have done just that. Um, so actually, we, we just need to move on um, and if that frustration is um, sensed around that table, that um, gives us as officers clear direction on the sorts of conversations we might follow up with. 
just just to support totally Monique's comments. Um, and I, I think we might need to just toughen up and, and say, look, we need to move on with this. We, we've got to, got to get this lease sorted. And um, are you going to be party to it or not? Rather than have the we won't until conversation. Okay. So that is the end of that monitoring report. We now move to um, 9.2 on page 299. Uh, proceedings of the District Plan Steering Group, 22nd of February 2023, not 22. Um, so again, 2.1, 2.2, the report be received and... Um, the minutes that council received the minutes. Move uh, Councillor Jennings, second and Deputy Mayor Allen, all those in favour. Against Carrie, sorry. <laughs> um, proceedings of the uh, 9.3 proceedings of the Otaki to north of Levin and Levin Town Centre Task Force of 22nd of February 2023. Uh, I'll move these be received and that we receive the minutes of that task force meeting, seconded by uh, Councillor Jennings. All those in favour? Against? Carried. And finally, proceedings of the Risk and Assurance Committee of the 1st of March 2023. Uh, the report be received and we receive the minutes. Again, moved by Councillor Jennings, seconded by Deputy Mayor Allen. All those in favour? against carried and there we will adjourn the meeting to have a dinner break oh do we go into committee but we've already gone into committee so uh we need to go back into committee because we're only going to go back into committee okay i just adjourned that though I love it. All right. I'll move that we um, move to in committee to recommence the meeting that we had already started. <laughs> Second by Council Jennings. All those in favour? Against carried. Thank you. Um, so it is now 6.34. Uh, we will be back at 7 p.m., um, Rogan, uh, to uh, commence the in committee meeting.